BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute. And those taking part are Anne Scott James, Phyllis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meanings of these words approximately right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Anne, what's the meaning of exotic? Oh, this is often uh, slightly wrongly used. It's yes. to mean glamorous. It really means foreign. Yes, I think that's good enough. From abroad. Two marks. Foreign, coming from a foreign country, not belonging to the country in question. So if you talk about an exotic blonde, you oughtn't probably to do so, unless you are actually in Mecca or somewhere like that at the moment, where exotic blondes are not very common. Frank Miller, this is quite different again. What is a chitak? C-H-I-T-T-A-C-K. C-H-I-T-T-A-C-K. Chitak. Chitak. I think when, uh, when one civil servant uh, dislikes another, he doesn't punch him, which is uncivil service-like behavior. He sends him a, a memo with four-letter words on it. <laughs> and this, this attack, as it were, by chit is called a chit-ack. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, it sounds Indian. Yes, Indian is quite it's a, a chittagong and... Uh... Uh, it's an Indian weight. Roughly oh. corresponding with an ounce. Um, now, dearest Powell, what is a jobbernowl? J O B B E R N O W L. Jobbernowl. Jobbernowl? Mm. It's like, uh, it's a scout's term. It's like bobber job. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you get paid for every hole you dig. It's a jobbernowl. It's a jobbernowl. <laughs> <laughs> It's a kind of, um, it's what I feel like. Well, I hope when you I don't. can't answer yes, the question. Might. Yes, that, that's very close indeed. It's a, it's a dumb, white-haired lady. <laughs> I'll give Anyhow, you one. It's, it's, I'll give you one and a half jolly, marks. Silly woman. I can't give you two because there's nothing about white hair to this at all. It means a stupid head, or a stupid, one. silly there person. You are. Exactly what I said. <laughs> from an old word from the French meaning fool and knoll meaning head. So the head's all right, but not the white. One and a half. Dennis Norden, what is a wheat ear? W-H-E-A-T-E-A-R, one word. Wheat ear. Wheat ear. <coughs> wheat ear sounds like the maximum amount of emotion an unsentimental Scotsman would permit himself. Just a wee tear. But what, if it's W H, you said it's W H E A T E A R, a wheat ear. Could I make a tremendous intellectual leap <laughs> and suggest it's an ear of wheat? <laughs> That's why I kept it as one word, because I think it would be two words if it were what you've just suggested. Oh. And it is one word. Well, then it's something that looks like an <coughs> wheat. No, not, not like quite. Of wheat. Oh, it's a bird, actually. Yes, all right. It's the stone chat, or white tail, and I have to go very carefully here. It was originally not wheat ear, but wheat ears, and if you think that out very carefully indeed, it means a bird with a white behind. <laughs> One out of two. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of each team to study them. And at the end of the programme, I shall ask them for the source of these two quotations. So, beginning with Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden, your quotation is, Next of Kin, and Dillis Powell and Frank, yours is The Last of the Moicans. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written or otherwise dealt with. And then round two itself, which is about legend and mythology, two marks for correct answers. Anne Scott James, who was Eolus? 
A E O L U S. Eolus. Oh, he was the wind god, and he kept the winds in a bag. Yeah. Whenever he let them out, there was a storm, and he lived in the Straits of Messina. Oh, well done. Yes, yes, yes. That's terribly <coughs> good and accurate. <laughs> He was a favourite of the gods on Olympus, and Zeus appointed him the ruler or keeper of the winds, and, as Anne quite rightly says, um, from his island in the far west, which is completely surrounded by a brazen wall, he was visited by Odysseus and gave him winds that he could use on his voyage, and all the nasty winds were put up in a leather bag, and some very unpleasant character unloosed that, and it wasn't very nice for Odysseus. Um, two marks it is. Frank Muir, who was Hebe? H E B E, Hebe. Was what Hebe was different from what Hebe now? <laughs> Said he, <coughs> covering time while he reads what Dillis has written. <laughs> yes, the, the, is, 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 the cup bearer. Yes? Hebe, the bearer of the, um, the cup. Send for Hebe. <laughs> of the gods. Yes, yes. Cup, uh, the cup bearer to the gods. That was her job. A maiden it was, a, a lady. Yes, it, yeah. Uh, it's her job, but what was she the goddess of? Mirth and laughter and cheerfulness and gaiety and uh, let's go on a bit. How many <laughs> can we have? Um, um, the goddess of um, jocularity and... Uh, well, drink, wit. Any, drink um, anyway. Uh, one and a half, uh, two. <laughs> um, as Dillis Powell quite rightly says, she was the handmaiden of the gods and she poured out nectar in cups for them, but she was the Greek no goddess advertising. of youth the goddess of rejuvenation, and hence when she moved over to Rome among the Romans, she was called Juventus, which meant youth. One and a half. Dillis Power, who was so strong that even as a newborn babe in his cot, he strangled two serpents who tried to kill him? Heracles. And do you remember was, why they were there? Well, his, his mother yeah. was determined to protect him and so she had him brought up among a lot of girls. <laughs> and somebody, I think Odysseus, in order... Was it Odysseus? I can't no. remember. Somebody, anyhow, no. not Odysseus. Somebody who suspected that he was really a tough young gentleman put the snakes there to see what would happen. <laughs> I think I'm going to give you your two marks. You've mixed up two legends, but you've done it so delightfully that I don't mind. <laughs> uh, Her up, Heracles or Hercules was the son of Zeus, not by his proper wife, but by a girl called Alcmene, and his real wife, Hera, was so jealous that she sent these two serpents to finish Heracles off. But later, it's quite true, Heracles had to live among the women as a penance. Two marks. Dennis Norton, who was Hymen, or as you and I know better, Hymen? And I emphasize, who? <laughs> You want to know about what? <laughs> um, he was Greek. Yeah. Um, he was the god of. wasn't love. I mean, it was marriage. Yes. Got to do with marriage, as in Hymen, the mood for love. <laughs> 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 Two marks, Dennis, that's all right. He's the Greek god of marriage and of the marriage song, because um, in origin, according to one legend, he fell in love with a girl and because he wanted to be with her, disguised himself as a woman in order to go with her on a, an all-woman sort of band or pilgrimage to a place called Eleusis and then saved them later after they were all attacked by pirates. Um, and then he married the girl and everything went well and uh, this uh, hymeneal song was sung on the procession of the bride from her parents' house to that of the bridegroom. The next round's about slang expressions, and they came into use mainly during one of the two of the last great wars. Uh, and I want to know what they mean. Two marks, you get them right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Sky pilot. Sky what? Sky pilot. Sky pilot. P-I-L-O-T. Ah, oh, yes, padres. <laughs> <laughs> like that'll do. Um, Two marks. Just Cler a clergyman, especially among uh, um, naval types and people like that. Frank Muir, to work one's ticket. Well, that was to, uh, to pretend that one uh, 
one was unfit for military service and therefore be discharged. Two marks it is. No ha about that. Have yourself discharged from the forces by getting yourself judged medically unfit, frequently not quite justifiably. Two marks. Lewis <laughs> Powell, it's all teed up. T double E apostrophe D. It's all teed up. It means everything's it's all prepared and yes. ready. Comes from? Golf, I should say. <laughs> I think it's a rather easy one. <laughs> Two marks it is. It's all arranged, it's all organised, all laid on, and it comes from that least difficult, or supposedly the least difficult shot at golf, where you have, in fact, arranged the ball very carefully on a tee before you hit it. Two marks. Dennis Norden. All wool and a yard wide. This wasn't in any of the wars I was in. <laughs> it's either something that, that's absolutely marvellous or absolutely terrible. <laughs> something to do with a uniform. With it? Wool. It's all wool and a yard wide, said the sergeant ringingly. Yes, <laughs> just so. Yeah. And meaning? I don't know. I never did understand what they said half the time. <laughs> um, but, um, I've never heard it, Jack. I've never heard it. Would this suggest um, something good or something bad, Dennis? It's all woolen. Depends the tone you say it in. What? That's all woolen a yard wide, that is. Or you could say, by golly, he's all woolen a yard wide. Well, that's it. <laughs> Dennis, this is what I want. But are you expressing approbation or the reverse? Approbation. <laughs> all right, one out of two. That <laughs> <laughs> helped a bit. It means utterly sound and honest, any, anybody you meet who is that. And it comes from terms of drapery, meaning the very highest quality and a jolly good bargain at the price, too. Well, now we come to a more or less appetizing round of foreign foods. Two marks, if you can tell me what you would expect to be served with if you picked up a menu and asked the waiter, assuming he wasn't entirely stupid, for the following. Anne Scott James, kebab, K-E-B-A-B. -B. I should expect some delicious little pieces of lamb, probably lamb, which would have been sprinkled with salt and with delicious oriental herbs and speared on a skewer and grilled on a charcoal grill. But were the little bits of lamb entirely adjacent to each other? Uh, well, I've eaten a lot of kebabs and in the sort of uh, rather common or garden places. Yes, they certainly would be. But with any luck, you'd have little mushrooms stuck, bay leaves yep. stuck between. Thank you very much, Anne. That's exactly... I'll send the recipe to anybody who wants <laughs> it afterwards. <laughs> exactly what I wanted, Anne. Pieces of lamb and various vegetables, sometimes other meats as well, threaded on a skewer and then roasted. And it's a Turkish dish by origin, though it's very like the Greek souvlakia. Frank Muir... Pumplemousse. Pumplemousse is a, it's a half a thing you get in France, yellow <laughs> citrus food, <laughs> with a preserved cherry in the middle which you throw away. <laughs> it is, in fact, a grapefruit. <laughs> Pumplemousse is the French for grapefruit. Two marks, well done. The Dillis Powell, moussaka. I should expect something which was baked in a dish, which had some meat at the bottom, and then a layer of uh, probably aubergine, mm -hmm. and perhaps a bit of potato, yeah. and perhaps a bit of this, that, and the other. No meat. Absolutely. And a bit of cheese. Mm, jolly good. Mm, You're getting it absolutely, absolutely, absolutely delicious. It's a Balkan version of what we call shepherd's pie, but with aubergine, and it's Greek. Dennis Norton, goulash. Well, that's Hungarian, and yes. it's a sort of stew, and has paprika in it. Yes. And the more you eat, the less you sleep, <laughs> is my experience. <laughs> I think that'll do. Yeah. A savoury stew of beef and vegetables, well seasoned with paprika, and it is Hungarian. And originally, it means herdsman's meat. Herdsman's pie. That's yeah. what it is. Well, herdsman's pie. It's like shepherd's pie. pie yeah. it? <laughs> it's also a term from contract bridge, but I'm not very good at that game, so I won't go on with that. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, mm -hmm. Anne Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation in its particular context, Next of Kin? All I can remember is going to a film in the war called Next of That's Kin. That's right. It was a wartime film on careless talk and espionage where the plans of uh, a raid on the 
far coasts as it might be at Dieppe. Um, they were inadvertently passed over to the enemy and everything went wrong. To his pal, the origin of your quotation, and this was The Last of the Mohicans. It's the title of a novel by Fenimore Cooper. Jolly good. Well, now I ask um, Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever unlikely explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back, first of all, to Dennis Norton and his phrase, next of kin. I would entreat, nay, plead, with anybody in a moving car never to throw a lighted cigarette end out of the window. I say this because some time ago I was walking along the Bayswater Road in London on the Hyde Park side and I knelt down to tie up my shoelace facing the railings. <laughs> and I felt this searing heat behind me as though I'd been fired on by a tracer bullet, <laughs> and I shot forward. <laughs> now, you may think, as I thought, <clears throat> that by the simple laws of nature, if your head enters between two railings, <laughs> it would naturally withdraw just as easily. But it was not so. <laughs> I found I was stuck in this crouching position, <laughs> with my head stuck in the railings on the unfashionable side of the basement. Of the <laughs> and I tried to attract the attention of passers by, but you don't get them on that side of the road at all. In fact, only one person passed a lady in a sort of rabbit coat, smoking a cigarette. And she looked at me, wriggling and pulling back between these two bars of iron which prisoned my neck. And she said, hello, cheeky. <laughs> <clears throat> and I, I ignored her and pretended I was just sort of an ordinary common or garden peeping Tom or something. Like <laughs> and continued with my struggle. It was now about half past one in the morning, so I stretched my arms wide and grasped about five railings further on either side and pulled upwards and felt something giving. That whole segment of railing came away and I was able to stand, but with the railing round my neck, <laughs> about the size and the shape of a window frame, I thought, how am I going to get home? Because you it would be very difficult to get on a bus <laughs> because upstairs, I only like travelling upstairs because I smoke and you couldn't get through that narrow bit and I was walking down the Bayswater Road in this kind of giant collar and I suddenly noticed a police car coming I thought hello, so I saw at the side of the road there was um, a hole in the road where workmen had been digging and I jumped down this hole <laughs> and the railing sort of spanned the hole and my neck stuck out, my head and neck stuck out on top and I just sort of closed my eyes and hoped for the best and this police car passed and as I stuck in this hole thinking now what is my next move and a very elderly night watchman came out and he said hello, a football, I said stop just as he got his leg back <laughs> And I said, can you help me? He said, hello. He said, you just come up from the sewers. <laughs> I said, no, I'm stuck. This is a railing. Oh, dear, he said. Well, he said, I'll ring an ambulance. He said, I'll, I'll ring Bart's. And sure enough, I went down there and had to do this awful ordeal in the waiting room for an hour among all the drug addicts, you know, and the people who had been beaten by their husbands and so on, <laughs> trying to look rather nonchalant if I'd, as if I'd come for an ingrowing toenail. <laughs> But they were very good at the hospital, and they've got this oxyacetylene lamp. <laughs> and when I woke up, I was on this hospital bed with this marvellous feeling of freedom round my neck. A feeling that's only known to people who worn a railing for two or three <laughs> hours. And I thought, I must thank the nurse, and I stretched back 
to ring the bell. I don't know if you know hospital beds. <laughs> yes, they've got these bars. <laughs> Which is why this phrase that was quoted always has a particularly poignant ring for me. Neck stuck in. I was always taught, Dennis, you carried a quarter of a pound of butter in your pocket and you smeared it all over your ears and then you got out. Perhaps it doesn't work. Well, back to Frank Muir with his quotation, which, if you remember, was the last of the Mohicans. Funny, Dennis, telling that story because it, it uh, rather reminded me of my last brush with the medical profession. Uh, a few days ago, um, I was sitting in my club in the morning room reading The Lancet. <laughs> There's an article by Dr. Jonathan Miller, and I read The Last of the Americans by Dr. Jonathan Miller, and um, I was crying quietly to myself. <laughs> I wasn't sad or anything. Don't think that for one moment. But I just had lunch, and I'd had goulash <laughs> for lunch, which has paprika in it, you know, which is red pepper. And some of the paprika had lodged around one tonsil, and was sending out little shock waves of heat, rather like a t miniature blast furnace. And I was coughed and, and uh, cried, and the tears were streaming down. And I was trying to read this article in The Lancet by Dr. Jonathan Miller called The Last of the Americans. And the name Jonathan Miller suddenly rang a bell. Um, I do a television panel game, and also on the program, a little while back, um, was this man who'd written this article, this Jonathan Miller. And he was on this program. And he looked at me and said, you've got a really rather interesting condition of Raynaud's disease. Would you mind very much if I, if I came along and I examined you? I got a bit worried about this. I mean, a, he's a pathologist, you know. To, <laughs> but I went along anyway and he said, well, Raynaud's disease is actually, when you're very cold, uh, the blood circulation affects your hands and your fingers go sort of dead which mine do they've always done they go right dead back to the hands and he said and the colder it is the deader they go i said do you mean if it sort of meets in the middle i'll die he said no 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 it's nothing like that but he said if i could give you a thorough examination could you come back on thursday and uh, uh, measure yourself and weigh yourself so i thought well i better you know go into this so i went away and I weighed myself, and knowing doctors, I weighed myself with nothing on. You know, and I it was 13 stone too. I only just had time to read it because there were other lot of people in the chemist shop at the time. <laughs> then <coughs> <But they, coughs> I went along to his, uh, to his rather nice little, little room, and uh, he said, well, well, what I'm interested in, he said, is, is that does this only happen in your fingers, or does it happen in your other extremity? I said, my head. And he said, no, no, no. No, your feet, for instance. We must try. Because the weather was still cold. So he backed a table against the window, opened the window, took off my shoes and socks, and slid my legs out of the window, and then closed the window down on them. <laughs> my feet got very cold. The whole thing was rather unpleasant. And a small boy chalked a rude word on my left side. And... and uh, and then he, he, he brought my feet back in again, and they'd gone white and colourless too, right back to the ankle bone. <laughs> and he got terribly excited about this, because I don't know about you, but I've got corns. <laughs> but he got frantically excited at these. He said, when we know disease, don't you see, they're shining. He said, this is the most interesting thing, that your corns are shining. They have a sort of lustrous, opalescent look to them. He said, may I a moment? and photograph my poor feet and the corns and, and he got the light so the shine reflected off the corns and presumably he wrote his article because suddenly it, sitting in the club reading this The Last of the Americans by Jonathan Miller in The Lancet I suddenly realised that this was the story of my 
shiny little calluses on my feet. And I knuckled the goulash tears out of my eyes until I could focus more carefully and found it wasn't the last of the Americans at all. <laughs> you know what the, the title of the article was? The Luster of the Muircons. <laughs> What Frank was really suffering from was third-degree frostbite, from which there's absolutely no cure at all. And we reach a very remarkable result with a very remarkable audience, because there is an absolute draw between Frank Muir and Dennis Norton. You've given exactly the same amount of applause to each of them, and that leads us to a final score in which Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win by two marks from Dennis and from Anne Scott James, and that also brings to an end this edition of my word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute. Those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their vocabulary. Two marks, if you can give me the meaning of these words approximately right. <coughs> Anne Scott James, what is a cross? C-R-O-S-S-E. E. Yes, E. Oh, this takes me back to my Ronald Searle days. Yes? It's a stick with a cradle-shaped basket affair on the end with which you play lacrosse. Absolutely right. Two marks it is. Thank me, huh? What is a bleb? B L E B. A bleb? Hmm. It's a, it's a derogatory word, much used by waiters and dance band leaders to describe uh, rich young girls um, enjoying their first season. <laughs> it's short for blooming deb. <laughs> a bleb. A bleb? A coin? Nope. Not a coin. Is it a cheese knife? <laughs> it's no. an Indian word. You might cut it off with a cheese knife. A bleb. Ah, it's a kind of carbuncle. <laughs> I think one out of two, because I help quite a lot. A bleb is a small blister or bubble. It can be on the skin, it can be in the water, it can be inside glass, as it were. Sometimes you can't see through completely. That's a bleb. A little spar. What is a quiff? Q U I double F. A quiff. A quiff is a bit of hair. What kind? Um, it's sort Coiled. Of, it's curled on your forehead. Flat, plastered down. Absolutely right. Two marks you get. And Dennis Norton, what is a trepang? T-R-E-P-A-N-G. It's made up of two words, tree and pang. <laughs> and it's... It's, um, 
having a pang behind a tree. <laughs> um, it's kind of uh, remorse, a fit of remorse in a forest. <laughs> Arboreal angst, you know. Um, we all do it. Um, other than that, I, I, I don't know, it looks like a Malaysian. It word. is? It is Malaysian. Is it Malay? Yes. Like right. Penang and... A yes. weapon, would you think? It's a weapon that slices <laughs> you into three. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah? Um, half a mark for knowing it's Malaysian. It's an edible sea slug used in China for soup, but it is a Malay word. Well, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of the team to study those quotations because I'm going to ask them where the quotation comes from at the end of the programme. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden, your quotation is, Hope springs eternal in the human breast, and Lillis Powell and Frank Muir, yours is I shot an arrow into the air. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these words came to be said or written. And round two is about legend and mythology. Two marks for correct answers. Anne Scott James, 50 heroes sailed with Jason. What were they called and what did they set out to find and bring back? Oh, they were called the Argonauts, and they went in search of the Golden Fleece. Absolutely right. Two marks it is. Frank Muir, who was Hyacinthus? A youth. <laughs> yes. <coughs> a youth of, I would fancy, not too hearty uh, a nature. He um, is actually a French... It's a French man's Christian name, isn't it? Eosand. Yeah. And he got deaded by somebody whose name escapes me, and a drop of blood fell to the earth, and from which sprang the flower we now know as, um... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um hyacinth. Dead right. I think that's jolly good. <laughs> Get your two marks. He was a beautiful youth who was beloved by two gods, which was awkward, Apollo and Zephyrus, the god of the wind, and he returned the love of Apollo which made Zephyrus very jealous. And while they were playing quoits, the kind that you throw, uh, Zephyrus made the quoit turn aside in the air and hit him on the head, and poor Hyacinthus fell down dead, and as Frank quite rightly says, from his blood there sprang the flower Hyacinth, and if you look very carefully at the petals of the flower, it has on it I-I, which is the noise that he made, poor chap, in his dying pangs. I-I. <laughs> Dennis Powell, what is a cornucopia and how did it come into being? Cornucopia is a kind of horn which is filled with plenty. Yes. It's filled with little oranges and grapes and cucumbers and lettuces and... Sounds like a mixed salad. Yes, pears. it is. Yes, pears. I like yes, pears. Yes, yes. You like pears. William. Well, it's, it's full of everything. They all sort of trail out. And it's a history? It's history. Well, I should think of one of those goddesses who were full of plenty carried it. <laughs> like Ceres or something like Ceres that. Ceres carried something very like it, but it isn't the origin of the, uh, the legend. Horn of plenty. One out of two, I think. <laughs> it is a horn of plenty, but uh, Zeus, when he was a baby, had to be looked after by an animal nurse, a goat. And the goat broke off, or somebody broke off one of the goat's horns, and Zeus uh, turned it upside down, filled it with fresh herbs and flowers, and eventually placed it among the stars as a constellation. Uh, there is one theory that Zeus was so strong as a baby, he broke off the horn himself, and gave it the power of becoming filled always, however much you took out of it, it went on filling up. Is that why goats are called nanny goats? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, <see>. Definitely. <laughs> Dennis Norden, what do you know about Nix? N-Y-X. Nix. <laughs> Nix was the goddess of underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I tell you what else I don't know. Um, <laughs> Nyx was married to the Greek god Zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of real nothings they were. Uh, oh, the, the, the goddess of underwear lived in the Greek pantheon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I suppose it wouldn't help. I don't help. think there's very much more to be said about. <laughs> you said, huh? certainly said almost enough. Mm. But would it help, help you at all if I called her Knox, N-O-X? Knox is, is Latin for night. night. <laughs> Nox Noctis, yes. Yes, yes. Nix or Nux in Latin, Nox was the personification, the goddess who personified night, daughter of chaos, mother of the air and the day, and also the mother of Hypnos sleep and Thanatos death. Quite a girl. On our round of verse and poetry, I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to complete it with the next line or two. Two marks if they can finish off the quotation and two more for correctly naming its source. Beginning with Anne Scott James. The vilest deeds, like poison weeds, bloom well in prison air. What was that? Ooh, Somebody in the audience had an idea. Something to do with a jail. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it Oscar Wilde? The Ballad Wilde? of Reading yeah. Jail. Yes. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde's Ballad of Reading Jail. You've got the source. Can you finish off the quotation? No. no. <laughs> All right. Um, two out of four. The vilest deeds like poison weeds bloom well in prison air. It is only what is good in man that wastes and withers there. Oscar Wilde, Ballad of Reading Jail. Now, Frank Muir. As someday it may happen that a victim must be found, I've got a little list... I've got a little list. list. It's Gilbert and Sullivan. Well, uh, one. Uh, make a do about nothing. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> it's society offenders or something, 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 and they never, never will, will be missed. missed. They will none of them be, be missed. missed. Mm. Yes. Sung by? Cuckoo. Yes. <laughs> Gilbert as some day it may happen, from the Ricardo, sung by the Lord High Executioner, Coco, and the chorus, as some day it may happen that a victim must be found, I've got a little list, I've got a little list of society offenders who might well be underground and who never would be missed, who never would be missed. Four marks. Dillis Powell. This fortress, built by nature for herself, against infection and the hand of war. Shakespeare. Yes. Richard II. Yes. This this blessed eye set in the silver sea and all that. Yes. Sort of the sceptered isle. Mm. Yes. It's, um, as they said, Shakespeare's Richard II, it's John of Gaunt's speech, which begins this royal throne of kings. This fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, oh. this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea. Dennis Norton, the noble Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. That's... Terribly decent of you, Jack. <laughs> Noble Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of a hill and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. When they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. <laughs> yes, jolly good. I needn't ask him for the author, I think. Which, um, it's anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that wasn't a very difficult one. Mm. It's the Noble Duke of York, which is an 18th century ballad, and I think the Duke of York concern was commander-in-chief and not thought of all that well as a general. And uh, Dennis did it absolutely accurately, so I won't repeat it. Well, now we have a different kind of round. The members of the teams are not actually successful criminals, but I'm going to ask them if they can guess for two marks the meaning of the following examples of underworld slang. Beginning with Anne Scott James, the awful place, sometimes called the AP. Well, I suppose it means jug. Yes, a particular one, though. A particular A one. particular jail. Yes. Dartmoor. Dartmoor it is, sometimes called the moor, but often called the awful place. Dartmoor prison, two marks. Frank Muir, to go bent. It's the antonym of to go straight. <laughs> it means to uh, to go crooked. Yeah. And of a girl? Of a girl? Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're bent anyway, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> you get your two marks. It's all right. Of a man, it means to become a crook. Of a girl in um, crook slang, it means to be unfaithful to a man who is in prison. Tell us, Pa, a chopper. A chopper? A chopper. Oh, um, to be executed, isn't it? No, no, you're on the wrong side of the law. Wrong side of the law. A chopper. Um, it's the man in the gang, the crime gang, who is the Thompson submachine gunner. And also the gun itself is sometimes called the chopper. He bumps really? them off. I never He's was brought up in that kind of society. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Norton, to cool off. Well, I don't know, isn't this mean 
when the heat song is the yeah. opposite of when the heat song. Um, what do you do? You go into hiding. Yes, yes you... absolutely right. You get to two marks. Yeah. To cool off means to stay in hiding until the police hunt is called off or until the heat is off. And it is different from being, as it were, in the cooler or cooling your heels, which is quite different. Two marks. Well, now we come to the last round. And we go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier on in the programme. Two marks and Scott James. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? Hope springs eternal in the human breast. It's Pope. Yes. Alexander Pope, essay on man. Now, Dillis Power, I like the origin of your quotation. I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth, I know not where. Mm -hmm. Two marks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Longfellow? Yes, Longfellow it is. And I shall ask Dennis and Frank <coughs> to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back, first of all, to Dennis Norden. Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Well, a rather mangled version of this appeared as the headline in a Times music critic's column, and I'm afraid it was all my fault. Um, the whole thing started a few months previously when I rescued a Dutch girl in a very elegant hotel dining room from what could have been an awful death. I saved her from being mowed down by a runaway hors d'oeuvre trolley. <laughs> I, I don't know if you know, this, this terribly elegant and expensive hotel where I was being taken, I was, only there, I was taken to lunch by this film producer who wanted to make a film called Marty, which was based on the life of Luther. And um, <laughs> he... Uh, and I saw this hors d'oeuvre trolley, you know, in these big, great, big, posh hotels, the hors d'oeuvre trolleys are like small trams, you know. And uh, this was, and the floor had an incline on it, and I suddenly saw it start moving, and it gathered speed, and it hurtled across the room, spilling out Russian cucumber and red cabbage as it went, and directly in its path was this girl who was bending over. I don't think consciously, she just she had very heavy earrings. And with great presence of mind, I swept her out of its path and it went on to splatter itself harmlessly into an elderly waiter. <laughs> Actually, I heard that there were a team of surgeons were picking black olives out of him for six hours. Was, anyway. The, this girl's husband, a Dutch businessman, was pathetically grateful to me because they'd only been married three weeks. <laughs> and he, he, with tears in his eyes, he said, I shall repay you for this mine here. Um, he said, I will send you the biggest token of my gratitude that I can make. But of course, the old sort of cupidity glands started <laughs> extruding like mad, you know, because when you think of Dutch businessmen, the first thing you think of, obviously, is diamonds. Right? You know, that's right. However, there is another major industry in Holland, which I, too, had forgotten, and that is cheese-making. <laughs> first intimation of his gratitude that I had was when the van man from British Rail Services knocked at the door of my flat and said, it won't go in the lift and I'm not hauling it up the stairs. <laughs> I went down to the hall and there was this cheese. You remember the coronation coach? You remember the wheel of the coronation coach? It was approximately that size and about two foot thick as well. And I gazed at it. As it happens, I'm allergic to cheese. Ever since an instant in my youth, when I pulled on a pair of bathing trunks in which somebody had left a loaded mouse trap, <laughs> And the very sight of cheese, I still whimper. So I said to the van man, 
can't you take it away? He said, I'm not moving it. I didn't know what to do. This great thing about 200 weight of it there and bright red. Then I had this absolute brainwave. In flat number one lived a young musician, a student at the Royal Academy of Music, who was studying the harp. <laughs> exactly. When you come to think of it, an enormous cheese and a harp, a harp is an ideal cheese cutter. <laughs> if placed on top of an enormous cheese with two large grown men sitting on the frame, it is really virtually little more than a cheese cutter, a harp, with intellectual pretensions. Well, anyway, we did this and we sat on it and they took the cheese away in this slice and it should have been the end of the story but unfortunately and I still will feel very bad about this this young student was giving a recital that night at the Wigmore Hall and he took his harp and cheese it's either cheese has a kind of emollient or lubricant action or else it was the weight of us on the frame but we loosened the strings of his harp and what he was playing was a piece by Schumann, a test piece for harp and flute. And at the eighth bar he came in, grabbed a handful of strings and plucked them back, released them, and they flew right out of the harp into the audience <laughs> and struck a distinguished military gentleman who was sitting there right in his DFC. Um, <laughs> and that is why I feel so guilty and that was the reason for the heading on the Times Critics musical column the next day. Harp strings hit Colonel in the Schumann test. Just see that terrible cheese. And now we we'll go back to Frank Muir. And if you remember, his quotation was, I shot an arrow into the air. I shot an arrow into the air is actually the chapter in my memoirs which deals with my war service in the Royal Air Force, number one parachute training center, Ringway, Manchester. All the places in this story and all the names are absolutely true to protect the innocent. <laughs> that day, the day I remember most of all of my war service there was the day that the commanding officer of number one PTS, Group Captain Newnham, made me a corporal. You can imagine the feelings in my breast as I stood in front of him and he pronounced this because before that I was a flight lieutenant. <laughs> It was a fairly brief and decisive court-martial. <laughs> and the charge was an act of negligence resulting in gross breaches of standing orders regarding discipline and hygiene. Now, it came about uh, in this way. This was about, around about 1942. And um, it was a time when all of us thinking chaps were devising ways of winning the war speedily the, all these ideas were examined by chaps called um, research officers, ROs. They weren't really officers, they were civilians appointed by the air ministry. Usually distinguished army chaps retired, uh, engineers and so forth, and they went round and examined all these things, and very important chaps they were too. Now, I was very concerned at this time at this parachute training business because we, um, they used to load the chaps into Whitley aircrafts and tie up their parachutes. The parachutes had a thing called a static line with a clip and that was hooked on to a strong point in the aircraft and the chaps leapt out and the static line whisked the bag off the parachute. The parachute deployed and they floated to earth at a place called Tatton Park, <laughs> the estate of a man called Lord Ilchester, I believe. And this seemed to me a, a tremendous waste of petrol. Surely there must be another way of training these army parachutists. See, the thing with parachuting is it's terribly easy to... The first half of the, half of the operation, getting out of whatever you're in, is no trouble. 
It's really the second half, which is hitting the earth, where they need the training. So why do we have to waste petrol on aircraft and everything? Well, I was in the Nephi one evening, and suddenly the solution struck me. Near Ringway, there was a Cheadle in Cheadle in Cheshire. There was an old circus which had rested there. And in this circus, there was one of these human cannonball chaps. He called himself Senor Carlos. And he had uh, one of these cannons, and he stuffed Madame Lolita down it and wound a spring and fired Madame Lolita, and she went about uh, 30 feet up in the air and into a net. Now, this cannon was going cheap, I knew. In fact, it was going for practically nothing. And I had an idea, and I bought that cannon for 30 shillings. And I took it into a corner of Ringway Airport, where there was then, now it's all built over, but then there was a little meadow and then a pig farm place. And I positioned the cannon by the edge of the meadow. And I fixed a very strong ring near the muzzle of the cannon. And I doubled the strength of the spring inside. And I tried it with a sort of rubber man-sized weight, the one used to test parachutes, dropped it in the muzzle, wound up the spring, pulled the lever, attached, previously I'd attached the static line to my strong ring, and up it went in the air about 20 feet, the bag was pulled off, the parachute deployed, and it sank back to earth. I thought, here is my answer. So I wrote to the Air Ministry, I wrote to the RO, the research officer, and uh, one day, about three weeks after this, there was a civilian wandering near the cannon, a very distinguished-looking man indeed in tweeds, and the Air Ministry had sent down the chief research officer. He was terribly interested in this, and I said, try it, sir, try it. I went through the drill very carefully, stuffed him down the cannon, he fitted beautifully, <laughs> wound the spring up, and tripped the lever. I think it was just as I pulled the lever, or maybe as a, it was as the close-cropped head emerged from the barrel that I had remembered I hadn't fitted him with a parachute. <laughs> now, whoosh, he came out of that barrel, lithe figure, like Superman. <laughs> up and up in the air he went, in a very gentle parabola, he cleared the meadow where we usually landed, over the pig farm buildings, and he landed the other side, with like, what I can only describe as a sort of squelchy noise. <laughs> I must tell you, the other side of the pig farm was a morass, which the pigs had all churned up into mud, and then the nephi had a, 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 some enormous Dutch cheese somebody had sent them, which had gone bad, and that was there. And there was an army billeted near, and they didn't have, uh, obviously, main drainage, and they'd empty. It was a terrible... Uh, it was, uh, it was, and right into the middle of... Uh, with, research after that. So, of course, there's this court martial. And ever since, my Air Force records, as we call them, my papers, carried this. An act of gross negligence resulting in a severe breach of standing orders in regard to discipline and hygiene. Because when everybody read that, they said, well, what did you do? What on earth did you do? And I had to admit, I shot an arrow into the ear. <laughs> I can still see that disastrous parabola. And by your vote, Frank Muir wins the contest of the stories, and he and his teammate win the entire contest by two marks, and that brings to an end this edition of my word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.
The BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute. And those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what is a Dobbin? D-O-B-B-I-N. Well, it's a character in Vanity Fair. Yes, it is, but that's not the one I want. No? A Dobbin. A Dobbin. Well, it's a horse. Yes. Oh, it's a very, very stable horse for children in that case. Mm hmm. A child. I'll give you two marks. It doesn't know. It's a draft horse, which is a horse which draws things like pliers and carts or farm horse. And it's a diminutive, or not a diminutive, of uh, Robert. <laughs> pet name for Robert. Dennis Norton, what is an I I? A Y E repeated. I I. I I is Roman for two. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it's uh, uh, a sort of cent uh, a murmur of agreement, <laughs> or else it's um, a type of shallot, <laughs> as in I, I, that shallot. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's the animal, not the vegetable. No, I don't think I can keep this up indefinitely. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it's it's um, a naval expression of obedience. <laughs> yes, it's that too, I agree. <laughs> but not that wouldn't be an I. I. That's why I was very careful yeah. to use the article first. I, um, I don't think I'm going to get any this time. Yeah. I and I'm not surprised, because it's a squirrel-like animal about the size of a cat, which is found only in Madagascar. I was just about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Scott James. The meaning of the verb to hocus. H-O-C-U-S. To hocus. Well, it's half a hocus-pocus. Yes. Roughly. To hoax. Yes, to hoax is good enough. Swindle. Cheat. Yes, to hoax or to take in, that's the primary meaning. <coughs> it's also been used to describe the way in which you stupefy somebody with liquor or drugs or drug them. But the, your meaning is all right. Two marks. Frank Muir, what is a leotard? L-E-O-T-A-R-D. Leotard? Well, the name suggests that it's a lion who's rolled in pitch. <laughs> but actually, actually, <laughs> <laughs> actually, as we all know, actually, as we all know, it's part of a ballet dancer's, I think, rehearsal costume. It's um, yes. an attractively close-fitting uh, part, um, separate from the tights. Yes. I think it goes down slightly beyond where the tights start. <laughs> There's a kind of overlapping area, and the, the leotard takes care of um, difficulties north. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very accurate description, Frank. You get your two marks. A ballet dancer's close-fitting, long-sleeved upper garment worn over or with the tights as a practice costume. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down. And I want the two women members of the team to study those quotations because at the end of the programme I shall ask them where the quotations come from. So, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is ta ra ra boom die. <laughs> and Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, yours is should old acquaintance be forgot. And then at the end of the programme I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea as to how these came to be said or written. Your son. A round two is about legends and myths. For two marks, Dillis Powell, can you give me the answer to this one? One of the twelve labours of Hercules was the cleansing of the Augean stables. How did he accomplish this? Well, uh, being a rather 
a strong and powerful character, he diverted a river through it. Mm -hmm. And it washed it out. Mm -hmm. What were the Augean stables? Well, they were stables which housed a lot of, uh, of, of Dobbins. <laughs> <laughs> and Dobbins are not, in fact, mentioned, but they might have been there. I wouldn't yes. exclude them. Cattle. Yes, they were cattle. The stables of Augeas housed 3,000 of these, 3,000 oxen, and their stalls weren't clear, cleared out or cleaned out for 30 years, which is quite a long time. Poo. You, <laughs> you can imagine what happened. Hercules diverted the rivers, Alpheus and Peneus, through the stables and cleaned them out in one day. The king then built him, didn't give him his reward, and there was a war, and he killed the king and his sons, and thereupon founded the Olympic Games, which I always think is rather a nice touch. Two marks. <laughs> Dennis Norton, what or who was Hippocrene? H I P P O C R E N E, Hippocrene. <coughs> Sounds like a kind of brilliant team for horses. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I can remember there's a bit in kids, Ode to it? a Nightingale, uh, something about a beaker filled with the warms full of the warm south, the true and blushful hippocrene with beaded bubbles. It's the most marvellous drink commercial ever. With beaded bubbles winking at the brim, brim and purple stained mouth. Yes, fair enough. I don't think it's going to help so you. it's some right? kind of a drink. Yes? Magic drinking water from the river. You can drink it and drive a chariot. <laughs> <laughs> That's just it. Um, half a mark for trying. Um, hippocrene was the fountain or spring on Mount Helicon, and it was sacred to the muses and to Apollo, and became, in the end, thought of as a source of poetic inspiration. That's why you get your half mark. But according to the legend, it was produced by the famous winged horse, Pegasus, who stamped his foot on this particular spot, and the spring gushed out. Hippocrene. And Scott James, who was it who murdered his brother because he laughed at the city walls that he'd just built? And what did he do to provide the menfolk of his new city with female companionship because his city was filled with refugees and adventurers and so on and they were very short of female company? Well, I, now, wait a moment. Uh, Romulus must have built the wall. Yes. And Remus must have murdered him. No, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sorry. Remus laughed. Remus laughed. Yes. And Romulus murdered Remus, but the city was still named after Romulus. That's right. And what did they do about the shortage of female company? And laugh at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An enormous number of paintings illustrate this. Yes. Well, Dennis seems to think that they rape the Sabine women. You're absolutely right. I'm going to try to do that. This is all right. On the wild. Not fair. <laughs> they were crushed. They fell for the Sabine women and carried them off and took them to Rome and founded that um, rather tough race which endured for so long and pestered us at school. That's it. That's absolutely right. Uh, Romulus <laughs> on the uh, Capitoline Hill, or the Palatine, I can't remember which, Capitoline, I think, um, was building walls in order to make his city safe. And Remus, instead of helping, was sitting and laughing and then finally jumped over the wall to show how inefficient it was as a protection. So Romulus hit him and killed him. But later on, because they were short of wives, he organised this snatching or rape of the Sabine women, and as uh, Anne quite rightly says, Rome never looked back after that. <laughs> now, Frank Muir, what was the end of the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, who'd been forbidden by their parents to marry? And I don't want the bottom Midsummer Night's Dream version. <laughs> <laughs> Tragic history of Pyramus and Thisbe. Yes. Concerned a wall. Yes. Well, that's in the bottom. And yes, it's there too. <coughs> and they uh, spoke to each, each other through chink, through a, a knoll in the wall. <laughs> and thereafter, the love story is rather Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? A little. It's the tragic, yes, it is. It's the yes. tragic thing because there's a lion in it, also in Shakespeare. And um, one of them, Pinamus and whoever was the chap, of <laughs> Pyramus and Thisbe. Um, he, the lion scared, she arrived first, and the lion scared her, and she dropped her mantle. And he came and thinking, well, the lion dropped blood on the mantle. And he came and seeing, thought she'd been devoured by the lion, but she actually hadn't, she'd scarpered. 
and he thought she'd been <laughs> eaten, so he uh, did himself in. And um, the stage is littered with bodies. <laughs> and the, the actual answer to your question is the curtain falls. <laughs> yes, that's a very <laughs> vivid description <laughs> of the legend. And Frank is quite right. It's, it's extremely like the story of Romeo and Juliet because here were two families who hated each other and the two lovers, Babylonian lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, could only talk to each other through the hole in the wall and they planned to meet away from that, under a mulberry tree, and there um, Thisbe saw a lion, was terrified, dropped her veil or mantle, and the lion had just been eating a cow or an ox, and therefore the mantle got all bloodied. Pyramus comes upon it, kills himself because he thinks Thisbe is dead, and Thisbe comes back and kills herself too. But the last bit of the story, it all happened under a mulberry tree, and the blood ran into the roots of the mulberry tree, and forever afterwards, mulberries, which up till that point had been entirely white, were stained purple with their blood. The next round's about verse and poetry, and in this round I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to complete it with the next line or two. Two marks if they can complete the quotation, and two more for saying where it comes from. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? While the sedge is withered by the lake, and no birds sing. Yes. It's by Keats. And the title? La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Yes, you get your four marks. <laughs> Just to get it quite accurate, uh, what can ail the knight at arms alone and palely loitering? The sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. Keats, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Dennis Norden. There was racing and chasing on Cannibal Lee but the lost bride of Netherby ne'er did they see. I would say it's some kind of a ballad. Yes. Walter Scott. Yes. <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute. Walter Scott ballad. Give me a Walter Scott ballad. All I can think of is Marmion. Yes. Go on thinking about Marmion. That's all right. <laughs> no, stay. stay. The bride rapidly removed from the scene. What is Young Lockingbar? <laughs> yes. Oh, is it? Young, yes. <laughs> young Lockingbar, who came out of the West. Yes. All right. Um, <laughs> it, it's, I'd better not ask you to complete it. <laughs> no, no you better not. Dennis. No. Um, all right. Two out of four. This is Sir Walter Scott, the Lockingbar ballad from Marmion. And these are the last lines. There was racing and chasing on Canterbury Lee, but the lost bride of Netherby ne'er did they see. So daring in love and so da dauntless in war. Uh, have ye e'er heard of gallant like young Lochinvar? And he quite definitely did pronounce war as war. <coughs> Too much. Might be young Lochinvar. <laughs> no. No, not if you think of Newcastle. Mm. They, 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 they flattened off the air. Anne Scott James. Few and short were the prayers we said, and we spoke not a word of sorrow. It's... Um... Uh, you know, not a sound was heard, not a funeral. Yes. Yet. Um, I'll tell you the rest burial of Sir John Moore. What, Corona. Yes, good. Um, author, can you do? Rather obscure. Wolf. Charles yes, Wolf. well done. Um, can you finish the quotation? Not this few, few and short were the prayers we said, and we spoke not a word of sorrow. Well, it's going to be a happy day tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's just hopeless. Let's hope for better luck tomorrow. <laughs> That's Yours, roughly what it is. Chias Wolf. Mm -hmm. um, three would be rather generous, Mark, but I'll give it to you. Um, Charles Wolf, the barrel of Sir John Moore at Karana. <clears throat> Few and short were the prayers we said, and we spoke not a word of sorrow, but we steadfastly gazed on the face that was dead, and we bitterly thought of the morrow. They were retreating, and that's why they had to do it all so quietly. Frank Muir, keep the home fires burning while your hearts are yearning. Ballad, First, <laughs> First World War, yes. written by Ivan Novello. Uh, no, but... Uh, Music by Ivan Novello. Yes, that's better. <laughs> keep the home fires burning. There's something indescribably sad about this song to me, <laughs> everyone. The singing of it doesn't help. Um, well... The hearts keep yearning, though the lads are far away, they dream of home. And absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
dark cloud shine. <laughs> yes, well, no, yes. <laughs> Turn the dark cloud inside out till the boys come home. And um, the words were by Mrs. Lena Gilbert Ford, based on a theme suggested by Ivan Novello, who did, as Frank rightly said, write the music. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. Uh, for two marks, Dulles Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation, Tarara Bumdie? It's a song. Yes. A Victorian song, I yes, think. Yes, it is. By a chap called Henry Sayers. Two marks. Now, Anne Scott James, <laughs> will you give me the origin of your quotation, which was, should old acquaintance be forgotten? I can't pronounce the old properly. Well, it's from old lang sein. Sign. 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 You mustn't say sein. We get letters from Scotland. They, <laughs> Robert they Burns. cross the border in their thousands if you say sein. We, did, we said it once before on the program. Yes, we did. Did we? Yes, did yes and they marched. <laughs> down the M1 it with their the sporans full of porridge. Yeah. <laughs> it comes from old lang sein. Sein. By yeah, right. Robert Burns. Absolutely right, and two marks. Well, now I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever unlikely explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. Mm -hmm. um, so, back to Frank Muir and his quotation, Tarara Boom Die. What I Know About Dogs, um, an essay by F. Muir. <laughs> Dogs are animals, uh, rather like horses. They're quadrupeds, that is, they have four rupeds on which they walk. They're rather like horses, not all that much like horses, because they're smaller. <laughs> Except if you get a very large dog next to a very small horse. <laughs> it is possible, it's difficult to st distinguish between them. Uh, if you find yourself in this predicament, the best thing is to wait until they're both moving towards you, then shout, whoa! <laughs> And the one that doesn't stop is the dog. <laughs> Unless the dog's name is Woe. In which case, it isn't a scientific test. Or unless the horse is deaf, it also wouldn't work. Dogs are usually kindly animals. Uh, they will eat out of your hand, or your leg, <laughs> or the seat of postman's trousers. But normally, they are very gentle beasts. Um, Shakespeare was a great namer of dogs, and some of the rather indeterminate names of dogs come from the works of the bard of Avon. Uh, the, the name Prince, of course, comes from Hamlet. <laughs> was he originally a great Dane? <laughs> Down Prince, you know, from Ophelia. And um, also, of course, in, um, in Macbeth, the, the dog which um, misbehaved himself uh, in the castle. And you remember Lady Macbeth saying, Out, out, damned spot. <laughs> there are all sorts of types of dog. Uh, there is the chow, uh, which is a large, rather hairy dog, uh, with eyes rather like raisins and a, a, a mauve tongue, which you can recognise because it's the same mauve as that wine gum which, when you come to it, you put your thumb over it and stop handing them round. <laughs> uh, these are very popular in Italy, and the, the puppies are called Chow Chow Bambinos. <laughs> there is also... In India, there is a large dog which the Indians train to jump up and down on the laundry, which is being washed in the river on flat stones. And the dogs actually do the hard work uh, of the Indian uh, laundry. Uh, unfortunately, your laundry doesn't always come back. <laughs> These are called uh, Dobyman pinchers. <laughs> Going down to the smaller dogs, one has the little tiny lap dogs like the, the little pom-pom, the little little furry white thing, rather like a, um, a sheepskin glove turned inside out. But the smallest dog of all is the Chihuahua, which is a, a naked Mexican dog about the size of a, a, a large rat. And funnily enough, this dog is the most popular of all today 
because all it eats is a teaspoonful of food and it requires very little exercise and, and it, it can fit into the tiniest flat and, and is the most popular of all after all these centuries of dogs. And that is why there is nowadays a... Uh, um, will you all join him? <laughs> there is a Chihuahua boom today. <laughs> I can just see Frank Miller's nice wife reading that rude telegram from the Canine Defence League after that story. <laughs> well, now back to Dennis Norton. If you remember, his quotation was, should old acquaintance be forgot? It started when my secretary came into my office and said, there's a man to see you. And I said, who is he? And she said, he says he's the man from Auntie. <laughs> and it turned out that... It turned out she was absolutely correct. He was a public relations chap called McGillivray. And he came in and he said, my dear fellow, he said, I think I have hit on one of the greatest commercial propositions of our time. Why don't we commercialize aunts? He went on to enlighten me. He said, if you remember, he said, for the retail trader, Mother's Day and Father's Day have been the greatest Philip to business since the invention of Christmas. <laughs> he said, now, why can't we do the same thing for aunts? He said, it could revolutionize the bath salts business, the chiffon scarf profession, the half dozen embroidered hankies industry. So I said, well, where do I come into this? He said, we have got to make, first of all, the British buying public aren't conscious. <laughs> and I said, well, from what I've seen of the British buying public, half of them already aren't conscious. He said, you've got... <laughs> you, haven't... you haven't quite... Understood. He said, we are on to a scheme here. He said, Auntie's Day could make Mother's Day look like Lent. He said, because <laughs> if, you, if you think about it, people have only got one mother, but everybody has got dozens of aunts. So you can imagine this in terms of turnover. I began to warm at this. I said, well, what part can I play? He said... We need communicators such as, if you'll pardon the expression, yourself. He said, we need to bring the word aunt into the forefront of the public consciousness. I said, how? He said, slogans. Buy a present for your aunt today. He said, songs. So I said, well, what, what kind of songs? He said, well, you adapt existing songs. He said, oh, my beloved auntie. Um, <laughs> We are in love with you, my aunt and I. <laughs> now my eyes began to glow. I said, you know what you could do as well? You could start a new vogue of aunt jokes. Remember, like, elephant jokes. <laughs> you could have aunt jokes, such as, um, which aunt has got a sore finger? So he said, which aunt has got a sore finger? I said, antiseptic. <laughs> and he... You see, he... No... He caught, on, he, caught on, he caught on to it immediately, you see. He said, which aunt is expecting a baby? I said, which aunt is expecting a baby? He said, Auntie Natal. You see? I, I said, yes, or it could be anticipating, couldn't it? He said, you're, I like your thinking, boy. He said, this could be the start of something... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I said, big. He said, yes. And that's, that's how it started. Well, as you know... Aunt's Day now is history. But I tell you the strange thing about this project, that 
The more I worked on it, the less the commercial side of it interested me. What I felt I was doing was I was doing something beneficial to these funny old ladies. Because aunts are funny, you know. There isn't a family that hasn't got a strange aunt somewhere. And yet here I was getting them their own day in the calendar. And this, this warmed me. It was sort of art for aunt's sake. It became <laughs> eventually. And after all, there is a kind of a justice in it. If mothers have a day and fathers have a day, should all the quaint aunts be forgot? <laughs> The only decent thing Dennis can do now is to go off and start that campaign in real earnest tomorrow. And by your verdict, uh, Dennis Norton wins the contest of the two stories, and that brings us to a final score in which, nevertheless, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win the contest as a whole by four marks, and this also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason, and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute. And those taking part are Anne Scott James, Tillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their vocabulary out. Two marks, they get these words' meanings approximately right. Beginning with Anne Scott James, and the meaning of the word securiform, S-E-C-U-R-I-F-O-R-M, securiform. Well, it means shaped like something or other. Yes? Um, in the shape of an axe. Absolutely right. Two marks, I thought it, it was is. some particularly tight tight sort of roll-on. All that, all that. <laughs> <laughs> now, from the Latin securis, which means an axe, securiform means shaped like an axe, normally applied botanically rather than anatomically. Frank Muir, what is a zebu? Z-E-B-U. Zebu. Z uh, what? <laughs> zebu. Zebu. It's a kind of artist's reception. It's not like the one we got tonight when we arrived. It's, um, if a, if a, 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 an artist, a, a singer, a chanteur, he goes on the stage and uh, the audience uh, don't like him, they give him uh, the boo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, oriental something. Nice but wrong. Um, it's the East Indian humped ox. You remember those things with a curious thing like a bit of a camel 
in the middle of their backs, otherwise looking quite like an English cow. As we've often kept one. Ha! <laughs> I hope it still flourishes. Dillis Powell, what is a valance? V-A-L-A-N-C-E, or can you spell it? I believe V-A-L-E-N-C-E. Valance. It's on those things at the bottom of a bed. And what is it? You know, that might be a chap. It's a kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Dirty shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of a frill. Which... Where, do you, where do you wear it? Wear it? Mm. Or the bed wear it? Mm. The bed wears it round its legs. Yes, absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, normally, that's perfectly true. A short curtain round the frame of a bedstead. It could be the one round the top in a four poster bed, round the canopy as well. Also, it is a sort of damask used in upholstering furniture. Too much. And Dennis Norden. What is a conquistador, or conquistador, if you prefer it that way? Yes, we know what this is. Um, Frank and I, a long time ago, wrote a, a television series about schools in which we did a lot of sort of schoolboy howlers, and we had a letter from a schoolmaster who gave an example of one that he'd had when he'd asked his form, who or what were the conquistadores? And a boy had answered, I do not know who the conquistadores were, and I do not know what the conquistadores were. But whoever they were, and whatever they were, may I be the first to wish them a Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so in view of that, we looked it up ourselves, <laughs> and they were, the, they were the people who appear in the Royal Hunt of the Sun. They were the, the um, Spaniards who conquered... South America, Atahualpa. And yes, it's Pitaro. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, not very merry Christians, weren't they? If you really come to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, conqueror it means, and usually one of the Spanish conquerors of Mexico or Peru, people like Cortes and Pizarro. Two marks. Well, before we begin round two, what I do now is to give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of the teams to study those quotations, because when we come to the end of the programme, I'm going to ask them where those quotations come from. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, here's your quotation. For men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. And Dillis Powell and Frank, here's yours. The remedy is worse than the disease. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. Round two is about legends and mythology. Two marks, possible maximum. Anne, Anne Scott James, um, a particular young man saw a certain goddess bathing nude in a stream and he spied on her. Who was the man and who was the goddess? And please, I don't want the story, I just want their names. Well, I should think the goddess was Aphrodite. No, 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 oh. no she wouldn't have minded. This one did. Diana wouldn't have liked Diana it. Diana was one of them, one half. You've got right, one half right. Oh. Um, can you get the chap? No mind. It was Actaeon, who was a huntsman and a young man, and Artemis, or Diana, was the goddess whom he saw bathing there, and uh, the rest of the story comes next, one out of two. Frank Muir, what was the outcome of the affair after Artemis spotted Actaeon watching her? Oh, I'm not allowed. I can't talk that sort of thing. <laughs> 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 she, yes, she changed him into a, um, a game thing, <laughs> a thing of prey, yes. and he raced off and was torn to pieces by her hounds. Well, not quite. What kind of... A lesson to us all, chaps. Very, very nearly right. What did, kind of beast did he turn her in, him into? Yes, into a stag. Uh, yes, I think I'll give you your marks. You've got one tiny bit wrong, but never mind. Um, Diana Artemis turned Actaeon into a stag and then, unkindly, set his own hounds on him because he'd come out with them because he was a great hunter and he was torn in pieces by his own hounds. Two marks. Tell us, Pearl, why are actors known as thespians? Because somebody called um, a thespis yes. was a kind of um, divinity of acting. Uh, you're not quite a divinity. Not quite a divinity. No. An no, eminent, was an eminent performer. No, no. Well, I'm trying to get... There are two things which come to a play. I have the play first. The play. Oh, he wrote... He wrote, <laughs> plays. He wrote plays. Well, I think one and a half, because I did help really rather a lot there. Thespis was the semi-legendary Greek tragic poet, sometimes called the father of Greek tragedy, who was the first to introduce an actor as such, because so far, tragedies have been performed purely by a chorus who 
sang together and danced together, and there weren't any actors at all. He was the first chap to produce an actor. Aeschylus produced two actors, and since you got dialogue for the first time. And so actors are called sometimes, not very often, I think, thespians. One and a half. Dennis Norden. Okay. I want the mum and dad of Achilles. Marquilles and Parkin. <laughs> <laughs> Thetis was his mother. Thetis yes. was his mother. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Thetis was his mother. Yes, that's, that bit's quite right. That's Ed. right, isn't And it? he must have had a god for his father. Uh, um, the trouble was he didn't. Godfather? Well, he was <laughs> dipped in. <laughs> that was the trouble, all the way through. Hence he was the heel. dipped in. Well, he was dipped in the river all yes. his heel. Yes. One out of two for Thetis. Peleus, who was a mortal, was oh, his Achilles, father. Oh, son of Peleus, my god. That's right. An hour round of origins and derivations, and there's three marks possible total, if members of the team can define the present meaning of this word or phrase or expression, and tell me where it comes from, what its origin was. And Scott James, who were the Junker set, and why were they so called? J-U-N-K-E-R, the Junkers. Well, they were German. Mm. Um, uh, Prussian, I imagine, yes. okay. They, they were Prussians, but a, 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 rather a particular sort of set of Prussians. Oh, yeah. booted Prussians. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe. Prussian but officers. Yes, you're getting Very married. Aristocratic. Think... Yes, that's what I want. That'll do. Um, two out of three, because you don't know, I think, why they were called this, but that's roughly the right description. But it began, um, the name began, because it simply is young hair, or young hair, meaning young gentleman. Two out of three. Frank Muir. To egg someone on it means to coax them forward, usually into doing something fairly drastic. Yes. And originally, <clears throat> well, in uh, in the theatre, it was to egg somebody off. They didn't suggest. But in the amateur theatre, where well, the difficulty is to get performers to appear on the stage. It became to egg them on. <laughs> and the eggs were uh, hurled at them in order to get them onto the stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's absolutely splendid. You've got the present meaning right. You've got the derivation entirely wrong. Um, to egg someone on is to urge them to commit some act, to do something. And uh, it's nothing to do with eggs at all. It really is a corruption of to edge someone on, bring them to the very edge and then push them off, if you like. It comes from an old Norse word, igja, meaning to edge someone forward, or Anglo-Saxon word, igjan, which is much the same. To prick or spur somebody on. Nothing to do with eggs. One and a half marks. Tell us, Paul, what is holy stone, and why is it so called? One word, H-O-L-Y-S-T-O-N-E, holy stone. It can be a, a verb as well as a noun. And it's what you, it right. what you clean your front doorstep with. Yes, not only front doorsteps, and not by origin front doorsteps. When our navy was well yes. bottomed, yes, this is and the ships were of timber, we wholly stoned the decks, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it porous, like pumice yes, stone? All right. It's porous, it's got holes in. This is one of the possible explanations, and I'll give you your three marks. Holy stone refers to soft sandstone used for scouring a ship's wooden desks, but this was done more particularly on Saturday, so that when it came to church parade on Sunday, the deck looked absolutely beautiful and white and shiny, and it was a holy stone because it was preparing you for the decks on Sunday. But there is an alternative explanation, which Dillis gave me, that the sandstone that they used to use is porous and full of tiny little holes, so it might be that kind of holy stone. Free mark. Dennis Norton, Jeep, J-E-E-P, -E Jeep. Oh, well, Jeep is a vehicle, it's... Um... I remember when they came in, they were American originally, and they were known as general purpose vehicles. Yes, you're getting there. Put your general purpose into initials and you're home and dry. It's a corruption of GP vehicle. That's right, that's all I did. Remarks. Now we have a quickie round of initials or abbreviations. Two marks if you get these initials and abbreviations right. Anne Scott James, E and O E. English and Old English. <laughs> 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 yes. Very good. 
<laughs> it's, it's what they put on the bottom, these terrible bills. But, but, they say. Yes, what is it? Errors and omissions and accepted. accepted. I always used to think it was accepted. <laughs> <laughs> well, between you, you've got it quite right. E and O, E is errors and omissions accepted, or meaning that the customer can't win. Two marks. Frank Muir, what did the V in V1 and V2 stand for? And what was the difference between V1 and V2? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, uh, Victor Hausen Damen Blitzen Rotten Schweinhut <laughs> Platz Ein <laughs> and Victor Damen Blitzen Rotten Schweinhut Platz Zwei. <laughs> That's a good start, but it isn't right, but that's jolly nice. Uh, but what was the difference between the two? Well, the V-1 was a pilotless plane yes. with wings and a, a kind of early jet propulsion. Yes. And the V-2 was a was rocket. Yeah. A rotten rocket. <laughs> the first of many. Yes. All right, one out of two. Um, V-1 was a flying bomb, and V-2 was a long-range rocket projector. Um, but they both, the V in both cases, stood for Vergeltungswaffe, which means a, a reprisal weapon. Because I think they thought they were doing it because the RAF had bombed their side, and this is what they did on our side. V1, V2. One more. Uh, Dillis Powell, EXOR, E-X-O-R, as an abbreviation, E-X-O-R. Executor. Yes, quite right. It's a legal thing, executor. Not to be confused with Exxon, which is the title of the Bishop of Exeter. Two marks. Dennis Norden, B-W-T-A. B-W-T-A. T-A, yes. T-A. Oh, Sorry, good. B-W-T-A. Association. Yes, it finishes association. Like... Bring washing to aunties. Association. <laughs> <laughs> It's a something, it's a British something. Women's. Yes. British, it's a British Women's Something Association. Right, right. Theological Association. No, no, it's Temperance. Oh, oh for goodness. <laughs> British Women's Temperance Association. And now we come to the last round. And we go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier on in the programme. For two marks and Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? For men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. It's The Brook. Yes. By Tennyson. Quite right. Tennyson's poem, The Brook, which starts, I come from haunts of Coote and Hearn, and then goes on, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. Two marks. And Dillis Powell, will you give me the origin of your quotation? The remedy is worse than the disease. Um, it's one of those essays of Bacon. Yes, it is. Yes. That's good enough. It's uh, found in Bacon's 15th essay on seditions and troubles, but it's much older than that. It's in Virgil's Aeneid and Tacitus and Juvenal and Lesage and other people as well. Two marks. And now I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being, and on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever improbable explanation gets the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, first of all, back to Dennis Norton. The men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. Well, talking about instant cocoa, <laughs> which I happened to be doing at the time because it was at a period when I was working for Instant Cocoa Incorporated. <laughs> I was um, in their advertising department at this particular moment. I was busy trying to write an advertisement which would persuade people that not only did our instant cocoa give you a better night's sleep, it also made you kinder to your children, elevated your social status, and restored colour to fading hair. <laughs> and while I was in the middle of this, there suddenly came this sharp cry from the research laboratory adjoining, a cry of earache. <laughs> of course, immediately I dashed inside and found this young research chemist, Ogilvy, his name was, clutching this cocoa tin of dark, rather viscous fluid, and he shouted at me, earache, earache. And I said, well, I've got some aspirins in the saddlebag of my bicycle. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm earache, the, the Greek word meaning I have found it. <laughs> and, he, <clears throat> and I said, well, you, you have found what? And he said, I'll show you. 
look, he said, the biggest discovery of my career, the biggest discovery of any scientist's career, I have found what mankind has been searching for since time immemorial. And immediately my pulse quickened, and I said, instant scotch? He said, no. <laughs> and he indicated on the table a book. He said, lift that up. And I put my hand forward and tugged the book. And the next thing my, I knew, my chin had hit the top of the table with a thud. The book was absolutely immovable. I said, well, how do you do that? He said, it's this stuff. He said, I was mucking about with some of the ingredients that go into our cocoa, brick dust and um, <laughs> sulfur tablets, marabone jellies, and I was just sort of mixing them round. He said, and I came up with this. I dropped a bit onto the desk, the book was on it, I couldn't move it. He said, I have discovered the ultimate adhesive, something which will make anything stick to anything else. I said, oh, come now, surely. He said, look up at the ceiling. And there up on the ceiling was a boot <laughs> with the laces hanging down. He said, I put a tiny, tiny drop of this on the sole of the boot, put it up there. He said, nothing will shift that. Now, I said, watch. He called his assistant in, who was a Miss Dearlove, <laughs> who I remember was six foot three, weighed 19 stone, and had hips like an avocado pear. <laughs> and he said, get that down, dear. She jumped up, grabbed hold of the laces, and hung there. <laughs> Nothing shifted. He said, that will stay up there as long as the building lasts. And I realized he'd done it. We were on to something. Something that mankind had always wanted, something that would make nails, screws, bolts absolutely obsolete. Possibly the greatest technological advance since overtime. <laughs> he had discovered it. it. I thought what it would do to the building industry. Houses could be put up overnight. Ships could be constructed during a lunch break. I said, we must tell the managing director about this, but first of all, we've got to find a name for it. Something, something that will attract people's attention. He said, oi. He said, that's what I always say when I want to attract people's attention. And I realized <laughs> this was a very good name, oi, the ultimate adhesive. I said, come, let us take this immediately to the managing director himself, Sir Humphrey Instant. So he said, right, and he made for the door, and I said, wait, because as he swung round, the liquid sort of keeled over, and I said, you'll spill half of it going there, put the lid on it. He put the lid on it. Well, of course, <laughs> when we got there, we looked right nanas. <laughs> there is no power on this earth that can now get that lid off the top of that <laughs> cocoa tin. The secret remains irretrievably locked inside. And I realized how true was the slogan that I had on my way there made up for this miracle product. Men make gum and men make glue, but oi goes on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sad, another technological advance lost by Britain. And we'll go back to Frank Muir now. And if you remember, his quotation was, the remedy is worse than the disease. You know, in this program, I've given the world many cures for many things. Devoted listeners will remember my certain cure for ingrowing toenails. <laughs> All this required was a simple, inexpensive clamp which dentists use to keep your mouth open, and a very long, slender rod. The idea being that you push the toenail out from within. Now, uh, <laughs> <coughs> tonight I want to give you a cure for air sickness. Now, um, I, I came across this cure, which is, always works, it's, it's quite infallible. Um, 
Last year, when I was on the island of Corsica, I was at the village of uh, Monticello, where I have a little house, and I was there with the family, and we were coming home, I realised, two weeks later, not by jet flight, but by a charter service, which used uh, pe petrol-driven propeller planes, DC-3s or DC-4s. And uh, this immediately sent me into a panic. I've got a phobia about petrol engines. Nothing to do with the DC-3, DC-4, marvellous aircraft, just the whole thing, because during the war I'd been violently sick in a DC-1. So I made inquiries of the Corsicans, who are very shrewd old country folk, if there is a certain cure for air sickness. And I was told that there's an easy cure. All you do is you drink a bottle of rum per day. So this I set about doing. There's about a couple of weeks left of the holiday. It's quite difficult because French rum tastes rather like a light marine varnish um, mixed with methylated spirits and aged in an old... Uh, very hard-working gardener's gumboot. <laughs> I, I just couldn't get the stuff down. I just couldn't drink it as a drink. So I decided to sort of absorb this bottle during the day. So I had um, cornflakes and rum. And, um, and I soaked my socks in rum, then put my shoes on, and hope I'd sort of absorb the rum by osmosis, like a tree. <laughs> And then I, I soaked stale bread in rum and pretended it was rum baba. <coughs> and I was getting through a, a bottle of rum a day for this, for this cure. Um, then a the funny thing happened, whether it was the sun or something, but I, I think I must have got a bit of sunstroke, because right about the fourth day, I felt a bit peculiar. <laughs> it was as though I, was, I could walk along all right, but my legs were two feet to the right of me. <laughs> uh, on the seventh day... That trouble disappeared, because all four legs were holding me steady. <laughs> but I was having a little difficulty buttoning my jacket at the back. <laughs> the next day, we had to go down to the mayor's parlour to get a little chitty for, for permission to drink the water. And uh, the mayor lives a little way up the hill from the village, and I was panting, rather. And after about two minutes, a piece of the wallpaper peeled gently from the wall. <laughs> My heavy breathing had struck it. <laughs> it was rather like a, a frond in the forest opening out. And then the varnish on his desk began to blister. <laughs> and the chain round his neck went green and unlinked, link by link. <laughs> on the twelfth day, I painted myself blue all over. It seemed at the time the only thing to do. <laughs> And on the 13th day, I collapsed entirely, and I was carried on a stretcher aboard the DC-3. And I had the most delightful, placid trip I have ever had. So this cure of a bottle of rum every day really does work, but I honestly can't advise it. However airsick you may get in these magnificent aircrafts, uh, do take Lord Bacon's advice. You know, really, it isn't worth it. In fact, the... The rum a day is worse than the DCs. <laughs>you'd have seen Frank still rocking slightly during that story. But uh, nevertheless, by your vote, Frank Muir wins the contest of the two stories from Dennis Norton by a narrow margin. And his team, that is Frank and Dillis Powell, also win the entire contest by four marks from Anne Scott James and from Dennis. And that also brings to an end this edition of My Word. Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.
BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. And this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute. And those taking part are Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Dennis Norton and Frank Muir. Round one to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meanings of these words more or less right. Dillis Powell, to begin with. What is oxyopia? O-X-Y-O-P-I-A. Oxyopia. What means sharp-eyed? Absolutely right. Can't feel fault you there. <laughs> it is, in fact, the noun. It means abnormally keen vision, but uh, it isn't the adjective. That's all right. Dennis Norton. What is a mammy? M A double M double E. Mammy. It's a boy's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Something to do with sucking, it must be. Why well, must? Or because oh, mamma means yes, a yes, breast. Yes. That which is sucked, I should think. No go. Well, yes, there is a connection here, I think, with. Um, but it, uh, you, you, uh, come on away from the animal kingdom, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Try vegetables for change. Well, it's, it's a vegetable that looks like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I, I don't think you're going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> it is a tropical American tree with large yellow pulped fruit. And oh. I don't think it looks like anybody's mother. Oh, <laughs> Anne Scott James. The meaning of miscreant. M-I-S-C-R-E-A-N-T. Miscreant. Oh, um, fie upon you, you miscreant. It means, um, a wrongdoer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, miscreant, vile wretch or villain, but originally, and as an adjective, it meant heretical and thence depraved, and it comes from a French word meaning somebody who was a misbeliever. He was a chap who was naughty because he didn't believe the right things. Frank Muir, what is a malmaison? M-A-L-M-A-I-S-O-N. Malmaison. <laughs> Mal... Maison. Yes. It's a... it's a house. Um, <laughs> at the end of the Mal, it's Buckingham Palace. <laughs> You're not so far wrong at that. It's, it's where one of Napoleon's girls lived. Well, we, we think it's where one of Napoleon's girls live. Um, give me the, the girl, or woman, and give I'll give you one mark out of two. Uh, well, Josephine. Yes, that's good enough. One out of two for that. Malmaison was a palace of the Empress Josephine, who married Napoleon I, but from the house came a particular kind of carnation. So Malmaison now is a particular species of carnation. Well, now, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down. And I want the two women members of the team to go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, They also serve who only stand and wait. And Anne Scott James with Dennis, here's yours. Do not cross your bridge till you come to it. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. Round two is about legends and myths. Two marks for a correct answer. Tell us, Powell, what was the name of the character who rode the bodies of the dead across the river Styx? And what was his fee for this service? And where was it kept, the fee? 
It was Charon. Yes. Uh, what, was, what was the next bit? I'm sorry? How much was he paid for the... How much he paid? Single. It's another return. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> he was paid an obol. Yes. And do you remember where it was kept? Oh, no. That's but too much. It's, an, it's um, all a nice touch. Is it? I and mean, where did Charon... In his pocket. ...pick it from? Oh, he took it from the tongue. Yes, that's what I wanted. Ah. Um, Charon, an old man in a black sailor's cloak, kept the ferry across the river Styx, leading to Hades, and when you laid out your dearest and best, you put this little coin, the obol, under their tongues so it wouldn't fall out. And then when they went to the Styx, Charon took it out of their mouths because that was, as you say, the single fare uh, into Hades. <laughs> Two marks. Next, Dennis Norton. The Sphinx at Thebes put the following riddle to every passer-by, and if they couldn't answer it, they were killed by the Sphinx who threw them over a cliff. What goes on four feet in the morning, on two feet at noon, and on three feet in the evening? And who answered this particular riddle correctly, and what was the answer? Which way is the cliff? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, not any windows cleaned or anything like that. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. This is a. Uh, it's man. I don't know why. But yes. I remember the answer to oh, it was man. He, in the evening, he goes with a stick. Yes. Three legs. Oh, that's it, yeah. When he's grown up, he goes on two legs, and when he's a baby, I've answered it the wrong... We've answered it the wrong way around. That's yeah. all right. Well, it's because, not difficult to answer. Anybody can answer it the right way around. We're answering <laughs> yes, that <laughs> question Sphinx backwards. Sphinx-like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's splendid. It's the, the backwards but quite correct answer to the riddle. And who, who did the correct answer? Do you remember? Anne Scott J. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I remember distinctly. Well, provided she didn't have to kill her father and marry her mother... I don't care, as long as we get the mark. Yeah. I'll, I'll help him. Oh, Oedipus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rex. No. Yes, Oedipus Rex. Well, not Rex at this stage, but later. Now, Anne Scott James. Who was Ancaeus? A-N-C-A-E-U-S. Was he Jason's cat, uh, pilot? Yes, that, you're getting there. Oh, come mm. on, get nearer. Yeah, that's it. You're getting, you're getting there. He was social director. Oh, yes. Um, P.R.O., that's mm. what he was. was Jason's <laughs> P.R.O. on the Argo. Well, I'll give you the proverb and see if you can invent a story to fit it. There's many a slip between cup and lip. Does Medea come into this? Uh, later on. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> I Sorry. think I'm going to give up. Now, uh, Anne Kiss was the helmsman, or the second helmsman, of the Argo... And when he was planting a vineyard, a soothsayer told him that he would never live to drink the wine from his own grapes. And so immediately the grapes ripened, and Chius squeezed them, some of the juice, very quickly into his cup, and was just about to drink it triumphantly, when the soothsayer, who happened to be there alongside, said, there's many a slip between cup and lip. And just then somebody came running up to say there was a wild boar which was devastating the countryside, and rashly Anchius put down his cup and rushed off to kill the boar, and the boar killed him. Frank Muir, one of the labours of Hercules was to steal a lady's girdle. Who was the lady? <laughs> Madame Lolo. <laughs> 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 nice thought. Aphrodite, I don't know. I think you're getting it. Aphrodite. No, 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 she had a girdle, but that's she had a girdle. She did, yes. Um, oh, really? Oh, dear, I'm helping you. It wasn't Antiope, it wasn't... No, do it to do with horses. Hippolyta! <laughs> All right, um, I don't know what to mark you this, I don't think more than half. The hero Hercules, or Heracles, had 12 labours, which he was made to do by King Eurystheus, and one of them was to steal the girdle of the Queen of the Amazons, Hippolyte, she was ready to give it up of her own accord, but Hera, the <laughs> goddess, was being very um, tough as usual and started a, a sort of local squabble going on. Um, and uh, in the battle, Heracles killed Hippolyte and got the girdle. We now have a round about origins and derivations. Three marks for defining the present meaning, first of all, and then giving the origin and derivation of these words or expressions. Dillis Powell, go to the devil. I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
The phrase is, go to the devil. Go to the devil. Present meaning and origin. Well, the present meaning is, um, well, I mustn't um, be too rude in my translations. Um, I really don't care about you. You'll be off and, yeah. and uh, we yeah. won't bother about you. Go to the devil. Well, it sounds like a kind of religious... Um, it isn't, you know. Isn't it? Mm. No. No. If I'd said go to the mermaid. Oh, mermaid. it was the name of a tavern. Yes. Do you, where, do you know where it was? Um, it was in London. <laughs> well, I've helped you quite a lot there. Um, one and a half, I think. <clears throat> if anybody goes to the devil, the obvious meaning is that they go to ruin, go to hell. Um, in the 17th century, one of the best known of all pubs in the city, near Temple Bar, was the Devil Tavern, and it had a lovely sign with the devil pulling St. Dunstan's nose. And Ben Johnson and other writers of the day used to go there very often, and use this phrase, he's gone to the devil, meaning this particular inn. It comes again and again in Elizabethan literature. So I think this probably is the origin. Dennis Norden, a guinea pig director. Are these one of these chaps who sit on boards of directors because they've got a title or something? Yes. Like yes. Well, that's what it is, the chap who sits on a board director because he's got a title. <laughs> <laughs> and why guinea pig? Well, presumably because you can make him do as you like. Um, or you're using him uh, simply for... No, I don't really know, Jack. I think you've got the main thing. It's um, the director of a company who was there really mainly for ornamental reasons, who didn't do much except attend meetings, and allow his name, usually a rather prominent name, to appear on the company's notepaper. It's, he was called, I think, a guinea pig director because it was the usual procedure to pay him a guinea or so and to give him a lunch every time he deigned to turn up to a board meeting. Two months. Anne Scott James, pumps, P-U-M-P-S. Well, they mean slippers. Yes. What kind of slippers? Um, they have low heels, usually, or no heels, and they're apt to have bows on the toes. <laughs> Men's evening shoes are called pumps. Yes. Okay, my, that my, far? Yeah, absolutely right so far, yes. Does it come from the pump room at bath? Yes, The that's bath it. attendants <laughs> slopped around the bath. The baths in pumps. Why would they do that? Well, because so they could keep kicking feet, them right? off easily, yeah. you know. <laughs> yes, they could kick them off lightly and slip them on again. Um, two and a half. Pumps are very light, thin-soled dancing or shoes or soft-soled, canvas-topped gym or tennis shoes. They were used for either. But Queen Victoria went to bath with Prince Albert. He was very pleased... <laughs> Was she amused? <laughs> <laughs> On this occasion, very amused indeed, because she found that the waiters in the pump room glided round the room so extraordinarily silently, and she wondered why, and she saw they were wearing these sneakers or pumps or very noiseless shoes so that they didn't upset the people who were taking the waters there. And this is where the rest of the story comes in. She insisted that all the waiters and stewards on the royal yacht should all be supplied with pump room shoes or pumps. And this is how they came to be called pumps for the first time. Frank Muir, he's a bit hipped, or badly hipped. It uh, means annoyed, doesn't it? It's sort of a let down. Let he's, down more. Yes. yes. Annoyed. He's badly hipped. He's been... Um, he's come out disadvantageously from something. Yes. And comes from... Well, it, it, it comes from... <clears throat> Uh, sort of Middle English period, when uh, it was believed scientifically that um, if you weren't happy, sorrow went to your hips, <laughs> and you, you, grew, you grew sort of fat and flabby around the middle. So to get, to get hipped... One and a half. He's a bit hipped means he's depressed, low-spirited, melancholy, and it is a corruption of the first syllable of hypochondria. From that, people said he's got the hip, and also, and more vulgarly, he's got the pip. But it originally came from hypochondria. Now the a round of, um, which is roughly the who, why, and what department. Again, three marks, correct answer. Dennis Powell, what were the four freedoms, and who defined them? Freedoms? Speech, <coughs> want, hunger, worship. 
You've said worship, you've said want, you've said speech. I want one more. Movement. No, no. Travel. No. Um, All right. Uh, it's, it's, it's Roosevelt. Uh, we'll stick at that. Who, who said this? Who Roosevelt. Did? Roosevelt, yes. Two and a half. The four freedoms uh, were defined by Franklin Roosevelt during World War II that one of the aims of all the democratic nations was that when the war was won, all peoples on the earth should live in freedom from fear, from want, and have freedom of speech and freedom of worship. Two and a half. Dennis Norton, what was the forces slang expression for PM, and what was the accurate term? Oh, um, Pip Emma. Yes. Um, Post Meridian. Yes, that's all right. That's what I wanted. Three marks. And Scott James, who was the patron saint of archers, pin makers, and soldiers, and why? Archers was St. Walter Gabriel. St. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Toxophilus. I don't know, really, the patron St. saint St. of pin makers. Um, what, hap what happened to him? When he was shot, he was sh shot with a rain of arrows. He yes. was martyred. And why was he the patron saint of soldiers as well? Oh, I should think he was a martyr. Oh. Hmm. Well, I imagine because archery was the chief means of <laughs> fighting in those times. Um, two out of three, I think. It is St. Sebastian. He was martyred by being bound to a tree and shot at with a large number of arrows, and they stuck out of his body in lots of these paintings, rather like a mass of pins on a pincushion. Hence, he was also the saint of pin makers. He was also a centurion, that is, himself an officer, and therefore on the side of soldiers and was patron saint of soldiers. What makes well, you think the officers on the, are on the side of soldiers? <laughs> oh. <laughs> a very generalized You never served in the ranks. <laughs> no. No, the, I, I, get, I agree, Dennis. Frank Noah still soldiers, who led his regiment from behind, he found it less exciting. The Duke of Plaza Toro in, in, the, in the Gondoliers yes. by um, Gilbert and um, Mr. Sullivan, who was a musical gentleman. Absolutely right. <laughs> and now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier on the programme. Two marks, Lewis Powell. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? They also serve who only stand and wait. It's the last line of Milton's sonnet on his blindness. Absolutely right. John Milton, sonnet on his blindness, um, ending thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. And Scott James, the origin of your quotation, which was, do not cross your bridge till you come to it. It's a proverbial expression. Yes. That's probably enough. Full stop. Mm. Yes, that'll do, I think. Anon. It, mm. it is originally an old proverb. It's quoted later by Longfellow in a poem of his called The School of Salerno. Don't cross the bridge till you come to it is a proverb old and of excellent wit. And now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever unlikely explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Frank Muir with his quotation, they also serve who only stand and wait. <coughs> I heard something on the wireless last night that made me go all horrible. <laughs> it, it was on the newsreel, and this lady who's president of the Hygienic Society or something, Mrs Mary Adams, she said that in the interest of hygiene, all domestic pets should be destroyed. Oh, I, I came over all peculiar. <laughs> when I think of me and my Hannibal, I'll be lost without Hannibal, because, you know, I just live in this digs in Notting Hill Gate, and uh, me and Hannibal, he's company, you know, we play and uh, we have fun together. You can't beat a budgerigar, you know. <laughs> but, I always remember when I first got Hannibal, I brought the cage home and I hung him up in my room. And it was awful, you know. He was lacklustre. He just stood there in his little cage, all blue he was, a lovely blue with a yellow beak, just sort of leaning with one shoulder against the bars. 
He wasn't interested in anything. He didn't play with his little swing, or didn't jump on his bar and play with his mirror. Nothing. Didn't he eat? I didn't know what to do. Then I thought, you know, he's, he's a young Badgie Hannibal. He hasn't got a mummy. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to play or eat or anything. I'll have to teach him. So, of course, I, I put him out on the windowsill and I painted bars on the window so to make it look to him as though he's looking inside a cage. <laughs> it was quite easy, really. I screwed the trapeze into the ceiling and I swung on it for quite a while. <laughs> it was really quite pleasant, you know. It was a bit awkward when the landlady came in, you know, explaining <laughs> why my face was blue, you know, my yellow nose and... Uh, but I swung away, and Hannibal started to take an interest, you know. But, oh, it was sweet. He wasn't eating, though. Would not eat. Not a bit. There was his bird seed in his little china bowl. Ignored it. He didn't know. He got thinner. Oh, it's always feathers started coming. I glued them back, you know. As best. <laughs> <laughs> Losing weight. Lo oh, I was so worried. <coughs> and I watched other budgies, and I saw what they did was they tramped round in their seed first and got sort of friendly with it. <laughs> So I got the seed merchant to send up half a hand of weight of wheat and I poured these five sacks it was of wheat all over the carpet and I took my boots off and I walked up and down in this wheat just to show him. Oh, it was all oh, terrible, it was terribly painful. And every evening, I didn't, I gritted my teeth and I stamped around on the wheat just to show him, just to show him how to do it and I said, look Hannibal, this is your food. Oh, my feet were, they were raw like slices of brawn and, and all itchy. I couldn't go to... Oh, I, oh, it's awful, it was. But after about the third week, he suddenly, little Hannibal, got the message and I saw him walking around with his own little feet all over his own bird seed and he started to pick it. And now he's a beautiful budgie. Lovely, big and strong and lovely feathers. Do you know, the other day I was reading in a paper, all about a policeman telling us how he trained all the Alsatians and what a terrible job it was and the way the Alsatians tore him to bits and leapt on him and pulled great chunks out of his arms as he trained them how to catch burglars. And I thought to myself, it's all very well. Ah, ah, Mr. Police Dog Trainer, you've suffered, but you don't know what I suffered to get my Hannibal well. I said, you may, you may suffer pain in your job, but they also suffer who only stand in wheat. <laughs> <laughs>
So it can be, as with us, that you say to them, have a nice evening, dear, in March, and next see them in September, <laughs> by which time there is quite a pile of washing up. <laughs> However, when they do go out, do show them round the neighbourhood and make sure they are acquainted with it. Hours left and came back and said she'd spent three hours in one of the little huts that we put up in case of blizzards. I followed her next time, saw her crouched in this telephone box. <laughs> now, my last tip. They're sleeping arrangements. Now, you must remember the sort of climate to which they are accustomed. We wondered why her bed never looked slept in. And I never really found out the reason till that night I came down at midnight for a snack. Opened the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it depends what you have in the fridge, if you do have blancmange setting, rice pudding and so on. So my last tip is, if you do have an Eskimo au pair girl, defrost the fridge all day and only use it when you are about to eat, or as the old proverb has it, do not frost your fridge until you come to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think there'll be a run on Eskimo au pair girls after that. And by your vote, um, Dennis Norton wins the contest of the two stories. And as far as the contest as a whole is concerned, he and Anne Scott James win by five marks from Frank Muir and Dulles Powell. And that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Newhall Community Centre, Weybridge in Surrey. Those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton. And here's round one to try and test their vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. We begin with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is sesame? S-E-S-A-M-E. -E. Um, well, we've all heard of open sesame, haven't we? Um, yes. It's also, I'm sure, Middle Eastern. It's a sort of seed or pod which you grind, crush or distill. Yes, except as far as I know the last. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Two marks. It's um, an annual herbaceous tropical or subtropical plant with seeds. Open sesame was this magical spell by which Alibaba got into the cave. Well, now on to Frank Muir. What's the meaning of unbosom? <laughs> well, Amazons used to semi-unbosom. <laughs> 
semi unbosom themselves because they used to remove, the ladies used to remove one in order to facilitate um, throwing a spear, or pulling a bow and arrow. If you're. To unbosom means to um, reveal the secrets of your heart. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That'll do, I think, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Two marks it is. To disclose or to reveal and to unbosom yourself is to reveal your innermost and secret thoughts. Dillis Bow, what is a tyro? T Y R O, or it can be T I R O. Tyro. Um. It's a kind of beginner. Somebody doesn't know a great deal about something. Mm, that'll do. Two marks. Beginner or learner in anything, a novice. Dennis Norton, what is a tick per longer? Yeah, the, the, the tip, tick per longer is the Mark II version of <laughs> the tick po, which was too short. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Try Southeast Asia. It's, I don't think so. I'm... It's a venomous serpent mainly found in Ceylon and India, and it's a word which means a spot viper, because it's covered with spots. Sorry. Well, now, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and uh, I hope that the two women members of the team will go on studying those quotations till the end, because then I shall ask them for the source of the quotations. And Scott James and Dennis Norden, here's your quotation. Events repeat themselves... And to this power with Frank, yours is, the lamps are going out all over Europe. At the end of the program, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. <laughs> Round two is about legend and mythology, and two marks, possible total. And Scott James, of what was Themis the goddess? T-H-E-M-I-S. What was she goddess of? Retribution, wasn't she? Uh, you're very near there. She was the goddess of something which, um, what you got as a result of your actions, yes. wasn't she? Yes, yes, yes. I cannot remember if they were fortunate well, um, actions. Well, look at that girl with the um, scales and the blindfold things and all justice. that. Justice. Themis was goddess of law and order and justice and the general concept of divine justice in all its relations to man and she was the daughter of heaven and earth. Frank Muir, Sisyphus was said to have built Corinth, and he became its first king. He did various good things, like promoting commerce and navigation, which was supposed to be very fraudulent and greedy in his dealings. And eventually he was punished by the gods. How was Sisyphus punished? Well, Sisyphus, uh, like lots of Greeks, invented various parts of the Olympic Games. <laughs> and the game that um, Sisyphus invented was pushing a peanut up a hill with your nose. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> His punishment was to push a, um, a block of uh, a, a stone, a sort of stone thing, presumably a, a stone ball, up a hill. And when it got to the top, it rolled back. <laughs> and he had to push it up again. Mm. A short right. nose. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right, Frank. You get your two marks. He had forever to roll this block of stone to the top of the hill and he never got it quite to the top and it always rolled back down again and he's doing it still. And oh. Oh. Of course, oh. it, well, <laughs> if you're listening, Sisyphus, <laughs> our, our hearts go out yeah. to you. Good luck, lad. Keep pushing there. <laughs> and here is the record you request. <laughs> <laughs> rolling stones. <laughs> Well, now, Dillis Powell, Mithridates the Great was a king of great ability and great energy, but in his youth he was the object of continual intrigue and plotting by his courtiers. And what were the preventive methods that he took against them? Um, didn't it have something to do with poison? Yes. He had somebody who sort of took poison for him, I think. Well, no, no, every, every king did that. Oh, wow. Well. King's taster. He tried all kinds of poison... Um, and got used to them. Yes, two marks. Mithridates the Great. He studied all sorts of poisons and venomous plants and gave himself tiny but repeated doses of all these poisons and because of that he built up a resistance inside himself to all known poisons and so couldn't be poisoned. Dennis Norden, who rode Pegasus, the winged horse, and slew the chimera according to Greek legend? Who rode Pegasus? He was a trainer. 
Um, <laughs> it wasn't amphit amphitryon. No, it was something. No, not quite. It was, it was Bellerophon. Quite right. Absolutely right. Well, the next round's about verse and poetry. What I do is to give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to complete it with the next line or two. Two marks if they can complete the quotation and two more if they can name its source. Anne Scott James, ill fares the land to hastening ills a prey. It's Ch Goldsmith, I think. Yes, quite right. Now, come on, I mean, all you've deserted got to do... Village. Deserted Village. But all you've got to do is do the yes. next line, Dennis. Yes. That's pie. I mean, I've done I the work. No, well, it's des it's des des it's deserted Village is quite right. It's something about some things' values decay. Or yes, right. Yes, decays. you've got almost the whole thing. Yeah. Um, three out of four, certainly. Uh, Oliver Goldsmith's deserted village ill fares the land to hastening ills a prey where wealth accumulates and men decay. Oh, so you've got most of that line. Frank Muir, standing on the bridge at midnight, she says farewell, blighted love. It's, it's a ballad. Hmm. Start again. She's honest, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. See him in the House of Commons. <laughs> passing lawyers to put down crime <laughs> while she's lying in the gutter. <laughs> Isn't it uh, something shame? <laughs> <There's> a... <laughs> Frank, but author. They're sort of spontaneous combustion. Yeah. Nobody's sort of <laughs> sits right. down and writes. That'll do. I'll give you one and a half on the <laughs> It's anonymous, and as the Oxford Dictionary of Quotation says neatly, there are many versions. <laughs> <laughs> this, this particular verse runs like this. Standing on the bridge at midnight, she says farewell, blighted love. There's a scream, a splash, good heavens, what is she a doing of? <laughs> She, she's actually a doing of herself in. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dillis Powell, if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? Well, it's the Merchant of Venice, yes. and it's spoken by Shylock. Yes. If you starve us, do we not hunger? Mm. Freedom from hunger. Right. Um, oh, I don't know. It's <laughs> Shylock in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, um, in the long speech, which keeps on saying, let him look to his bond, where he's having, going to have his revenge on uh, the merchant. Does bond if you, go back that far? Yeah. <laughs> if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? Now, Dennis Norden, there's a great text in Galatians, once you trip on it, entails... It's easy to trip on anything when you're in tails. <laughs> um, there's a great text in Galatians. Once you trip on it, in tails. Once you trip on it, in tails. Sounds like Kipling. No, it's earlier than Kipling, but I quite understand the, the reference. This is, she's got a sort of near one. Great text in Galatians. Great text in Galatians. Once you trip on it, in tails. Doing 47 press ups in the dance of the seven veils. <laughs> <laughs> is it not Kipling? Well, is, it, is it roundabout? Is it Byron? No, between the Hall? two. You, you, you bracketed the target. Um, Byron? Chap Browning. Browning. Yes, quite right. Do I don't know where it comes from or what, what, to, what happens um, next. It's Browning's soliloquy of the Spanish cloister. Uh, where one monk is very, very angry with another one and doing his best to do him down. There's a great text in Galatians, once you trip on it, entails 29 distinct damnations, one sure if another fails. And now a round of origins and derivations, three marks if members of the team can, first of all, define the present meaning of this word or phrase and go on then to say its origin, what it's derived from. <coughs> Anne Scott James, he knows the ropes. Well, it means he's a sort of smart cookie who knows his way around. Yes. I should have thought it came from um, sailing. It does. Mm. Up to all the tricks of the trade, knows the condition of some particular sphere of action, comes from navy or sailing in the days of sail, 
You couldn't be called an able-bodied seaman if you didn't know all the ropes on the sailing ship and how to use them and the knots to be used in the right places. Three marks. Frank Muir, platonic love. It means um, uh, a very sincere affection, uh, which, is, which is non-sensual. Yes. An affection of um, admiration and noble virtues and intellectual affinities and so forth. And comes from Plato's writings. Yes, which particular book? It's, it's really the fact that um, um, very intelligent men in early Greece, such as Socrates, had, yes. um, had very intelligent youths. Yes, yes. And um, they had a, a very real affection between them, which is called platonic. Uh, yes, that's... Where they eat... Eh? That's... <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's good enough, Frank. That's a very good definition. I'll give you your three marks. Uh, it means uh, a mutual love and esteem between people free from any passion or carnal desire. And that's normally now applied to that kind of relationship between man and woman. Um, in Plato, this was the relation between men and youths, and Socrates was the great example of this being entirely a matter of virtue and knowledge and beauty and not sensual at all. Hence platonic love. Three marks. So, Liz Powell, what was a foot pad and why? A foot pad was a, a, a thief on foot. Mm -hmm. And he padded along on foot. <laughs> well, so now, today, yesterday, tomorrow? Oh, in the 18th century. Yeah. And contrasted but, with? Um, the highwayman who rode on a horse. An apple, yes, I think that's all right. Three marks. Um, an unmounted highwayman who, on the whole, therefore, <laughs> preyed upon pedestrians rather than chaps in coaches or on horses, and about a century or so ago. Uh, some people think that he wore a particular kind of sort of sneaker, that is, a, a padded footgear, so he didn't make any noise and came up behind these unfortunate chaps very quietly indeed, hence foot pad. Three marks. Dennis Norton, what is an Albert and why? Albert is an old-fashioned what? No, it isn't a watch. It's the chain. Yes. I wouldn't give you tuppence for your old watch chain. <laughs> that one. And it, I presume it was Prince Albert. Yes? You're presuming because, absolutely right. Because he wore it, I suppose. He did? <laughs> it's a watch chain worn across the waistcoat from one pocket to another or to a buttonhole in the middle. That's, I think, an option. Um, Prince Albert, Prince Consort of Victoria, went to Birmingham in 1849 and was given a gold chain by the jewellers of the city for his watch. And this particular fashion of wearing it right across your either prominent or not stomach caught public fancy, and soon everyone was wearing them, and they were named after the Prince Consort. <laughs> and now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier on in the programme. Two marks, Anne Scott James. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? Events repeat themselves. Well, when I was a baby, which makes it practically 19th century, <laughs> my nanny had two great phrases. One was, it takes all sorts to make a world, and the other was, events repeat themselves. So I regard it as a nursery proverb. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, half a mark for having a nice nanny. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it might be some historian. Yes, I think that's more like it. Not Gibbon, I've tried Tacitus. Uh, you're getting nearer, but I think uh, if I let you guess all the Roman historians, mm. it wouldn't be fair. Oh. Roman a mark historian? A, uh, Plutarch. It, what, from Plutarch's lives, though it also turns up later on, it probably turns up lots of times, because it's a very familiar phrase, and, as your nanny knew, uh, repeated by Montaigne um, in France later on. Events repeat themselves. Now, Dillis Power, will you give me the origin of your quotation, which was, the lamps are going out all over Europe. It was said by Lord Grey at the beginning of the First World War. He wasn't Lord. Sir Edward Grey. That's it, thank Sir you. Sir Edward Grey. And what was he referring to? Well, he was referring to the fact that war was breaking out. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sir Edward Grey was Foreign Secretary at the outbreak of the First World War, and on, I think, the 3rd of August, he was standing in the um, window, of the f one of the windows of the Foreign Office, and watching the lamps being put out over London, and said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Two marks. Well, now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being, and on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause 
from the audience here in the theatre. So back, first of all, to Dennis Norden and his quotation, events repeat themselves. Do you know the definition of Nutch Getter? <laughs> Nutch Getter is the reply you get if you ask a ventriloquist doll about the state of its health. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I happen to know this because um, at an early stage of my career, I worked in a very junior capacity in the office of a theatrical booking agent. And this is how I came to be acquainted with the very attractive lady who was known around all the working men's clubs in the north as Lola Montez, the only accordion playing nude. <laughs> now, if you think about this type of act, which I invite you to do, um, it, for the lady concerned, it not only demands a certain amount of musical skill, but it can be very painful. <laughs> which is why one day Lola came to my office and she said, I want to change my act. I want to be a vent. A vent is the show business term for a ventriloquist. And I said, but surely you can't just become a vent overnight. And she said, look. And she took out of a long suitcase that she had by her the most exquisite and lifelike dummy that I'd ever seen. And she said, how are you today, Johnny? <laughs> and in a very deep voice, and without her lips moving at all, as far as I could see, the dummy replied, much better. <laughs> and I said, that's really very good. How do you do it? And the dummy replied, well, to be absolutely frank with you, I'm a midget. <laughs> and it was absolutely true. He was. Very nice chap, three foot six. And I saw that here really was, were stars of the future, and I set them on their way. And <clears throat> had it not been for a very well-known show business axiom, which says that lady ventriloquists are their own worst enemy, they would be TV stars with their own series today. But Lola fouled it up. You see, she insisted that in order to maintain the secret of their act, in order to maintain the fiction, that Jonathan should remain always with her, by her side, as a dummy. In other words, this meant that whenever they had to go out anywhere, he would go in the suitcase. <laughs> Similarly, she would always keep him in her dressing room or in the same room as she had at the digs. And I saw trouble brewing, and the tragedy finally happened, as they always do at the very worst possible time, and that was when they were invited to play at the Royal Command performance. And they came on to a thunderous ovation from this most distinguished audience, and they sat down, and she put him on her knee, and I could see he was emotionally disturbed. She was very, looking particularly voluptuous that night. And she said, well, how, how are you feeling today, Johnny? And he said, you're driving me mad. So we can't go on meeting like this. There was a kind of little murmur and stir from the cheaper seats. The, uh, the 15 guinea ones. And and she was a bit disconcerted, but she went on and she said, What did you learn at school today, Johnny? And he said, I want you. you know, I want you. We could make the earth shake. And he buried his face in her ear. <laughs> and there were now clamours from the audience. And one peeress shouted out, That ain't no dummy, that's a perishing midget. <laughs> well, of course, it was the end of their career. Plutarch said that events repeat themselves. It's even truer that lady ventriloquists 
are their own worst enemies. Or as we say in the business, she vents defeat themselves. <laughs> Remove my faith, I shall never believe a ventriloquist act again. <laughs> and now we go on to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, the lamps are going out all over Europe. The most unforgettable character I've ever known was old, um, oh, um, <laughs> uh, but he, he's, he's dead now. Uh, and his story is, is a sad one, an illustration of this, of the jest that life is. The jest of life, really, is that we always want to do and want to be what we're not equipped to do or be. I was no good with human beings, marvellous with animals. I always have been. They cluster around me, sniffing my legs. <laughs> if I go for a walk, I come back with a nest of field mice in my turnips. I've only really got to sleep in the open and ladybirds settle on me. It looks as though I've got raving measles. <laughs> he was the other way around. He desperately wanted to be a vet, this boy. He was my age. He loved animals. I mean, animals loathed him. He used to hold out his left hand for dogs to sniff. When I knew him, he was about 17, and the fingers on his left hand were half an inch shorter than those... <laughs> Honestly, animals bit him so much that, stripped for Jim, he looked deckle-edged. <laughs> I met him again. I met him again after the war. He, he was sort of middle-aged before his time. And sort of shambly, he, he had one of those uh, gingery, very thick tweed suits with sort of bits in them. As though it was woven from marmalade. <laughs> and, and, uh, thin, almost emaciated hair. And uh, he, he was... Uh, and he had one arm, apparently. <laughs> what had happened was, whenever he saw an animal, he always wanted to, to um, make it say, ah, and take its temperature. <laughs> and there was this robin, you see. <laughs> one blow of its wing, and it broke his arm, and... Uh, <laughs> Had to have it moved. Uh, uh, <coughs> he was actually up a ladder at the time. <laughs> it was an apple tree, and he said, say ah to the robin, whom he thought looked a bit flushed, and the, <laughs> the, the, the robin flapped its wing and dislodged an apple which fell on his fingers, and he fell off. Anyway, he was no arm. And uh, then I heard um, that he tried very hard to make friends with animals, and comfort them when he felt they were ill and he went even down to milder animals he gave up dogs he got down to lambs he thought that he'd be fairly safe from physical injury ministering to lambs and he was on this patch of grass and there were these these lambs and he bent down <laughs> and getting out his little spatula it's actually a lolly stick but um, <laughs> he said um, say ah but what he didn't know was behind him was the you. <laughs> the you, seeing the lamb attacked, well, just butted my friend, whose name was Oliver Sinclair Yarrup. It wasn't the butt that hurt him, it was the landing, because uh, it took rather a long time, and he got quite a lot of velocity up by the time it happened. As the coroner said, what he was doing on the edge of Beachy Head, <laughs> with, 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 with only one arm, but... And so... <coughs> My friend perished. But I feel, you know, if there is a hereafter, and I think there is, then he will be looked after. And I see him in green fields, among sheep and ewes and lambs. And if there is a paradise, the lambs are going, ah, to Oliver Yallop. <laughs> just what our dog thinks about our vet, but never mind. <laughs> and that uh, brings us to a final score in which 
Frank Muir wins the contest of the two stories, and his team of Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win by one half of a mark from <laughs> Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, and it also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason, and presented by the BBC.